Olympism is a philosophy of life that glorifies and combines the qualities of body, mind and will. It is based on the joy of effort, the educational value of a good example, social responsibility and respect for fundamental ethical principles. The goal is to build a peaceful and better world by educating youth through the practice of sport without discrimination of any kind and in the Olympic spirit of friendship, solidarity and fair play. Join us in blending sport with culture and education through Indian Olympic Education Committee at International Webinar on the 11th and the 12th of June with leading speakers to move forward with Olympism and Olympic education in the 21st century. Brought to you live and exclusive on One Play Sports Channel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you're joining us from. This is day two of the international webinar on Olympism and Olympic education in the 21st century. We concluded day one yesterday, and it was such a beautiful response that we got from all of you on our One Play Sports networks. Uh, remember, One Play Sports is where you're watching this uh, international webinar. We have a jam-packed lineup for you today as well. We're starting proceedings at 9 a.m. Indian Standard Time, and the, then we go all the way until 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time, after which we have a closing ceremony as well. Remember, we have one hour sessions, about 55 minute sessions, uh, which are divided into 40 minutes of presentation time, followed by about 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A. And that's exactly the format we will be following uh, today as well. I am delighted to announce uh, the first moderator for uh, today's session. It's Dr. Isha Joshi who is an associate professor at the Rajiv Gandhi College of uh, Physiotherapy in Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, Dr. Joshi will give you a better sense of who the speakers are for the, this session as well as what the topic is. Uh, before I hand it over to Dr. Joshi, I just have one simple request uh, to make. Uh, for those who are joining us uh, on the stream, we're seeing lots of fabulous numbers on our OnePlay Sports platforms. Make sure that you actually share this link with your friends, your family members, your acquaintances, and make sure that you subscribe to the page as well and follow the page because we've received so many responses talking about how valuable these sessions have been, how educational these sessions have been for everyone and of course as good citizens of the world we want to make sure that every single person can benefit uh, from the expertise of the moderators as well as the speakers who have uh, graced us on our one place sports platforms uh, and of course these or these sessions have been organized in conjunction with the olympic education committee as well as uh, the olympic education association uh, so dr joshi the stage is now yours i'll hand it over to you and you can take over and introduce the speakers as well as establish what the topic of discussion is for this first session today in this international webinar. Dr. Joshi, all over to you. Thank you, Anamba. And it's really great that you said it was a, a power-packed uh, session yesterday and I uh, hope and look forward to today being much, much more in experience and learning for all of us. So yes, this is uh, Isha, Dr. Isha, as you said, I'm from Bhopal and uh, additional to being just a professor uh, without the Chashma, I am also a uh, <laughs> founder of my uh, Physionics Clinics. So, but today we're here to talk about Jennifer and Dustin. So good morning, Jennifer and Dustin. Good morning from India. Good morning. Hi, welcome. Um, I, I am uh, Jennifer Carolina and along with my, my friend, my colleague, um, and also a Special Olympics athlete, uh, Dustin Plunkett. Um, and we're coming from Long Beach, California, outside of Los Angeles. Uh, and we're excited to speak with you today about the power of Special Olympics and the power of inclusion. Um, we wanna take this moment just right now to share a brief clip with you about Special Olympics. Um, and we'll begin our presentation afterwards. Sorry, just one moment, you know, technical uh, challenges, but we're looking forward to being with all of you today. It is currently 
8.30 p.m. in uh, Los Angeles for us. And I know it's a bright early 9 a.m. for you. But uh, Dustin is queuing up the video right now. Okay, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we'll have a chance to send that, but what we'll do is we'll actually include it into the comments so that afterwards with the presentation that you're, you'll be able to see it as well. Sure, sure. So yeah, it's 8.30, so now I think I should be saying good evening to you now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Jennifer and Dustin are going to be talking about the power of inclusion in, through sports today. Uh, uh, I know they have amazing profiles. I was going through their profiles. Um, so Jennifer uh, Karinen is, uh, you know, she's a senior director of sports in Special Olympics Southern California. Uh, Jennifer, you've got an experience of 16 years of sports event management, and uh, you have uh, three national sport governing bodies. You've been associated with them: USA Badminton, USA Cycling, USA Taekwondo. Uh, the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympic Games were a part of the 2010 Youth Olympic Games, and then you've been in uh, working with Singapore uh, Sport Council at Singapore Sports Hub and the 26, uh, 2016 IAAF Indoor World Championships. You've also participated in 2008 International Olympic Academy's Young Participant Seminar. And uh, let me tell you everyone, Jennifer uh, uh, was, you know, she first began working with Special Olympics at 2015 World Games. And you and she was a vice president of sports and where that, that is where she found her passion for Special Olympics. You know, and now she's worked at Special Olympics Southern California as a senior director. Uh, she's looking for, I don't know what number of ways to enhance the athletic experience and providing quality training and competition. So a lot of passion I can see there in that entire profile. Uh, Thank our next you. Dustin, Dustin, uh, again, uh, amazing profile. Uh, I sure do hope we're going to learn a lot. So Dustin um, Plunkett is uh, from the Special Olympics Southern California athlete. He has been active in Special Olympics for more than 23 years now, Dustin. He has thrived as more, both as an athlete and as a public speaker, which is not a small task for a young man with speech impediment. And Dustin, we know, has a cleft palate in addition to his intellectual disability. Dustin has risen to the highest ranks of athlete leadership as an international global messenger, where he has had the opportunity to travel the world, which is uh, one of his fondest memories he shares was uh, sharing the stage with Yao Ming at the World Games in Shanghai. We would like to hear about the Dustin sometime. Plunkett also relishes such each opportunity he can, you know, get to reach people, share his own story of successes, uh, over uh, talking about adversity in order to inspire others to do the same. And Special Olympics has empowered him to take control of his own life. He's also been a member of the board of directors of LA 2015, as well as a member of the GOC for LA 2015. So during the 2015 and 2017 World Games, he served as an ESPN analyst, uh, calling the parade of athletes live on ESPN during opening ceremonies. I, every everything just you know tops the other. So today, Dustin works for Special Olympics Southern California as a manager of outreach and international speaker. He's also a member of the Lakewood Toastmasters. He's currently serving as the club's president of membership. Great. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm seriously looking forward to learning so much from you people. Uh, I'd like to introduce a quote here from Perry G. Burton when he said that the most important thing in life is not to triumph, but to compete, not victory, but combat, not to have vanquished, but to have fought well, not winning, but taking part. So all of this comes down together and um, not taking much of your time. Uh, I would now hand over the stage to uh, Jennifer and Dustin. It's all yours, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Isha. And it's wonderful to virtually meet you. And I hope one day that we'll be able to meet face to face as well. So um, <laughs> we just want to say a huge thank you uh, to the entire committee um, for having us here today and being able to share our stories and how much Special Olympics has changed our lives. 
Absolutely. Thank you again for the introduction for having us here today. Um, we'd like to share our PowerPoint if we're able to do that right now. So Justin's going to um, figure that out. And Dustin, let me know in case uh, you might need any assistance uh, with sharing a screen. Uh, but I think it should be simple enough. You see this share screen button at the bottom of your screen? Yeah. It's just we're clicking, clicking it, but we have our our browser is blocking it. So Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like our server may be, be blocking it. So we're just going to try out a couple um, other things real quick. Yeah. Does it display any message when you click on uh, share screen? There we go. When it I think we got it now. OK. Perfect. We have it. Uh, there you go. Can you guys see it? Yeah. It's, it's yes, we can see okay. it. Okay. Fantastic. Perfect. Brilliant. So welcome. There's just one we request wanted? that I would make. Uh, so we see. We see all the slides on the left hand side as well. If you could perhaps just change this to full screen or presentation mode, I think we'll have a better view looking at a screen. It's, uh, it, it should be in the bottom right hand corner. Yeah. In the bottom right hand side, where you see the, the zoom in and zoom out uh, toggle, it should be the, the button to the left oh. of it. It should say presentation as well if you hover over it. Okay, yeah, I don't see it. Yeah, it it's not I know what you're talking referring to, but unfortunately that's not the screen that we're looking at. If you can exit out of that though. Um no, let me not just an issue it. then. I think I think we can still see a screen. So you can continue this way as well. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um no problem. Thank you. Well, just wanted to say again, once, um, thank you so much for having us. And we just wanted to go over about the power and the story of Special Olympics and the impact that it's had in both Dustin's and my life and what we're able to see on a daily basis. Um, but just want to give you a little bit of information about what Special Olympics actually is and what it's about, if you're not aware. Um, Eunice Kennedy Shriver uh, founded uh, Special Olympics 52 years ago. Uh, and she really wanted to find a place where she could have an inclusive environment for athletes with intellectual disabilities to have an opportunity to compete in sport and have competitive environments. Um, her sister actually had an intellectual disability and it was quite important to her that everyone had uh, this opportunity to compete and not be left out of, uh, out of chances. Um, so they, uh, Special Olympics was started 52 years ago, and her husband actually uh, was involved with the founding of the Peace Corps as well. So an incredible, inspirational family of doing good and giving back to help change lives for the better. Uh, and she was inspired so much through the Olympic ideals and movement uh, that she really just wanted to make sure that every athlete felt involved uh, and was able to receive a quality competition environment. Not that the athletes would, would be going to a daycare or a recreational place, but to have true competition opportunities. Um, and we have over 5.5 million athletes worldwide in over 190 countries. And this is phenomenal. And we're based out of volunteers. Uh, and our coaches are all volunteer based. So we have 1.1 million coaches and volunteers actively signing up and participating to help support our athletes year round. Uh, SOI, Special Olympics International, has 32 Olympic type sports uh, and winter sports uh, that are supported uh, internationally. And then we have seven regions around the world, uh, which include the ones that are listed below Africa. Asia Pacific, East Asia, Europe, Latin America, the Middle East, and North America. I can say that I started with Special Olympics uh, through the opportunity, while I've had an extensive uh, sport production and sport management uh, background and have traveled quite a bit, I moved back to the United States in 2015. And I started working with the 2015 World Games here in Los Angeles 
And the first person that I met whenever I started Special Olympics was the man sitting next to me right now, Dustin Plunkett. And he came into my new employee orientation and his story and his impact of what you're going to hear today is the reason, uh, the catalyst of my passion for Special Olympics and the impact that I can see truly makes a difference uh, within athletes' lives, volunteers' lives, uh, unified partners' lives, and how it is a catalyst of bringing everyone together and truly celebrating the power of Olympism and friendship and respect uh, and making sure that we're able to celebrate with one another. Now, we're a different organization because, um, as I mentioned, we work with athletes with intellectual disabilities. And so this is including, uh, it could be cognitive function, uh, skills, uh, primarily an athlete has to meet the three criteria that you see on your screen, that their IQ is below 70 to 75, uh, that there's limitations in two more adaptive areas, and that um, the condition manifests before the age of 18. And this is really just outlining uh, what Special Olympics believes is a core charter uh, of the individuals that we serve uh, and support. Um, and then also we're unique from other org sports organizations. Uh, we, we provide free opportunities for our athletes. No, no participants will be charged for any athletes or fa family members to participate. Uh, we actually have random drawing to advance to higher competition. So instead of going through the steps and the criteria that we have seen in the Olympic movement uh, and to go to Olympic Games or to go to World Championships, we want all of our athletes to have an opportunity to compete. Uh, and so we have a random selection based off of some of their previous performances. Uh, we do offer awards for all participants, but what we do is that we actually division our athletes so that they are in small divisions working together and so that everyone receives places from one through eighth, with medals being awarded to the first three and ribbons being awarded to the others. Um, and before I turn it over to Dustin, I really just want to say that the importance of Special Olympics is providing integrity to the athlete and having a quality level of competition um, and making sure that the athlete finds uh, the joy in competition. Thank you, Jen. And, and, and as Jen said, that Special Olympics International was, or Special Olympics Organization was founded by Eunice Candy Driver, who I had the pleasure of meeting on a couple of occasions. My greatest memory of her was when I was the International Gold Messenger in Shanghai, China, um, after opening ceremonies, there was a Spirit of China Awards. And all 12 of us were backstage and we we're helping uh, present the awards and everything. And somebody comes running backstage and goes, I need one of you guys to escort Miss Trevor from her seat to the stage and all that so she can give her talk and everything. And before I can even get a word out, all my fellow athletes were like, oh, Dustin should do it. So. I got to escort our fi uh, founder up on stage to give her talk and escort her back to the seat when she was done. And it was one of the lasting memories that I'll have of her because she passed away two years after that event and all that. So that was the last World Games that she has ever, and that she attended in her life and all that. Um, but about Special Week Southern California, where Jennifer, uh, Jen and I both work, um, we were founded by the 1969 Olympic gold medalist in a decathlon, Rayford Johnson, um, who is a very big supporter of ours and all athletes, not just here in Southern California, but all 5.5 million athletes from around the world. And one, uh, Rayford is an outstanding speaker and everything. And one of the greatest stories that I, uh, and like Jen and I's favorite story that Rayford always tells is Rayford was visiting at an event in Arizona and he's presenting medals and he's giving a first place medal to a young lady. And she looks over at her mom and dad in the stands and goes, look, mom, look, dad, I won. And her parents started crying and Rafer wanted to find out why her parents were crying. And we found out at the time that they, uh, Rafer found out that that was the first time they heard her daughter ever talk. 
first word they ever heard her say. And it's like, that was the power of our movement. That's what Eunice Kennedy Trevor wanted to have happen all around the world and all that. Uh, in 1994, 1995-ish, uh, California was so big that we split into two chapters, Northern California and Southern California. We're in Southern California. We currently have about 38,000 athletes uh, throughout a good footprint of ours. Um, we're in seven different regions um, across Southern California here. We have so many amount of great coaches and volunteers that are out at each and every event, giving their all to our athletes, making sure they're safe in every aspect of it. They have the water that they need to stay hydrated. Um, they're, they're out there cheering from the stands and motivating our athletes to do more. Um, they also help us put on our 200 plus events a year for our athletes, whether it's our community engagement or it's our school games or it's our healthy athletes and so many more events. And then we have great sponsors and donors that help us fundraise money and uh, allow us to do competitions and everything. Uh, but as I said, we're only serving 38,000 athletes, uh, but the population of Southern California is about 23 million approximately, and 2.5% of that population, which is the 575,000 people in Southern California that have an intellectual disability. And we're barely scratching the surface and only serving 38,000 of them right now. And we want to share that knowing that also worldwide, that this is a challenge that all Special Olympics chapters and organizations face, uh, how we're able to impact more lives. And it, we want to take advantage of that opportunity where we can touch lives in general. Yeah, and the numbers around the world, to give you the world figure, is in the world there's over 200 million people with intellectual disabilities, and we're only serving 5.5 million of them. So that's just to give you guys a scope of what the numbers are on a worldwide uh, figure. Uh, next is a mission of Special Mix, which is the one thing we all live by. Like the athletes love this mission. Our staff loves this mission. The only thing that's wrong with it, it is one, it is the longest run on sentence <laughs> in the world today. Um, but the great thing about the mission is our athletes, they really take away from this mission because you always see them demonstrate courage out there. They're showing up to their competitions. They're having a great time. They're going out and giving speeches or they're going out and doing something in the community and they're demonstrating courage and going beyond their limits that they ever thought that they can do. And they're always experiencing joy, whether it's uh, winning gold medals, uh, making new friends and all that. And we're always willing to share our gifts, skills and friendship with our colleagues or our friends and the family members, our community. And it's a great way and it's a great segue because it really compares very perfectly. Those three things compare perfectly with Olympism. And I want Jen to talk about that. Yeah. And this is why Special Olympics uh, resonates so much with me. You know, be, having the opportunity to be at the International Olympic Academy and study Olympism uh, with so many wonderful colleagues and uh, friends, you know, understanding the excellence, the friendship and respect and celebrating every part of life. Uh, that is Special Olympics through and through. And I feel like it truly embodies the importance of Olympism and how it's changing lives every day. Uh, the great thing is we have many opportunities for our athletes. Uh, one, first and foremost, is become an athlete in our traditional in our community program, which is our athletes going out and competing against other athletes of similar abilities. That's how we do our division is we make sure we division by ability, age, and then gender and all that. So that's how we do our divisioning to make sure it's the best competition out there. And Eunice was a very stickler of this. If she should go out to a track and field meet and watch every single race, she's like, why is that race so one-sided? How come it's not closer and all that? So she was really stickler about making sure that we division our athletes by those three uh, priorities. Uh, the biggest growth where we have most of our 38,000 athletes is in our school program. We got into schools maybe about five, six years ago, and it's just been taking off. Um, they're now doing inclusive uh, school stuff on their campus, uh, doing rallies, the, in the use of the R word, the word retard, 
um, throughout their school to putting on disability awareness trainings for their fellow students and all this. It's just amazing to see our school program take off. And it goes right into our leadership is those school students who are being leaders in their uh, schools, they're becoming leaders inside the classrooms. Uh, they're putting, they're, they're learning leadership skills, learning about talking and all that. And the side about where the leadership comes in with the athletes, the Special Olympics, is we have a program that like called Active Leadership, where we train our athletes to go out and give speeches, which I'll touch up more in detail a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, we have a young athletes program. It's for athletes from two to seven years old, where they're learning basic motor skills, social skills, uh, jumping, catching, throwing. Um, it's a great program. We've seen these athletes really grow from two to seven. And when they hit eight, they can enter into our traditional and community programs and really already know what's expected of them in doing that. Um, a great thing about the Young Athletes Program is it also could be unified. And unified sports, it puts people with intellectual disabilities and without intellectual disabilities on the same team, where the goal is not only are they teammates and competing against each other or and competing with each other on the playing field, but off the playing field, that's where it comes in more play. I mean, it comes in more valuable for us because it's that friendship that they form on the field that they take off the field with our lifelong friends and all that. How uh, Jen and I met in 2015 and we used to become friends and how we think of life, we got creative ideas. Like that is the power of unified sports and that's what's going on in all of our schools and everything to our traditional programs are now being unified where we have our law enforcement officers coming and playing flag football with our athletes is just seeing those bonds get stronger and everything. And our young athletes is unified too. So if there's a young brother and sister twins who might fall in that age group, they could both do the program together, even though only one of them has intellectual disabilities, the other one can join in as well. So it's a great way to bond and everything. So one item that we wanted to bring up with everyone were the three most important items that uh, Dustin and I feel of how inclusion is a part. Inclusion through sports, inclusion through health, and inclus inclusion through schools. And so Dustin's been able to take uh, it, the last slide and use examples of how we actively do that. Um, but most importantly, that we're incorporating everything together, um, whether it's through training and competition, through athlete leadership, or community engagement. Um, but I do wanna give, uh, I do want to ask Dustin a very important question that he posed to me a few months ago. And um, it's something that you can challenge yourself with, um, whether whatever organization, sports organization that you're working with. Dustin, are you here for or with the athletes? That's a great question, Jen. And when I first started, I thought I was here for the athletes. I thought I was here to put together the, our athlete leadership program and train athletes to give speeches and go out there and get their message out there and become people that give their feedback that can help grow the program overall. But over time, and it wasn't until I went to our unified leadership course, I realized that, hey, I need to be here with our athletes and working with them to get our training stronger and better, to help them voice their concerns more and make it where their voices are always heard at every single level of our organization, whether it's their region or here at chapter, uh, making sure that they get their feedback and we can make other improvements to make their life and their overall view of special needs better. And thank you for that. And that's it. When Dustin asked me that a year ago, it really made me think as well about my purpose through working with sport for the last 16 years, as well as working with Special Olympics. And I answered recently to Dustin that I feel that I'm here to work for and with our athletes. Uh, you know, in my previous career, you know, working with some of our Olympic athletes, I'm definitely working for them uh, and making sure that they're given opportunities. And that doesn't change here in Special Olympics, where I'm working to make our competition opportunities the best for them. However, um, Dustin and I are huge advocates, um, as well as our entire organization, that the athlete's voice needs to be heard in every meeting and every thing that we do. Um, and that is whether it's Special Olympics or if it is a national governing body 
or an international federation or the IOC, we need to make sure that the athlete's voice is always heard and prominent. Um, inclusion through health, um, most people don't know that Special Olympics is the largest health care screener for people with intellectual disabilities. And that is through our Healthy Athletes Program, where here in Southern California, we have six disciplines. But overall, there is seven different disciplines that our athletes can go through um, around the world and all this. Uh, this is where my heart is in this organization. Um, I love everything I do with athlete leadership and all that, but my heart lies with healthy athletes fully because it impacted my life about 16 years ago. Um, my coach saw my cheeks swelling up and he's like, hey, you need to go get your teeth looked at by volunteer dentist. And it, it was during this screening that I was told that I needed to go see a dentist right away to get x-rays so they can figure out what's going on. And I go get those x-rays and a dentist comes back in a room and tells me, um, Dustin, brace yourself. I got some bad news for you, but don't worry about it. I know how to fix it. And he goes on to tell me that I had gum cancer forming in the upper left side of my mouth. And if it just went one more month longer, I wouldn't be alive today sharing my million dollar smile with the world. Uh, so that's why Special Mix to me is not just life changing, it is a life saving organization. And because of our Healthy Athletes program, it may be the only screening, the only health screening our athletes may receive all year long is in this program and all that. So that's why it is important it catches um, medical um, things way in advance so they can be treated and get their lives uh, back healthy again. And, help them recover and quicker thing and make sure nothing serious happens to them. Um, another great program that we have here in Southern California that started in Special Mix, Oregon, and we adopted it about three years ago, is our Team Wellness Program, which is a great eight-week program that teaches the athletes how to eat right, how to do warm-up exercise, stay fit, um, eat the right vegetables and not um, – uh, like fattening food, like making sure you're eating um, the good, like something with no sugar rather than something with sugar, having water instead of drinking the Coke. It's just like so great. And we had this one athlete down in San Diego that said, I always knew how to eat healthy and stay fit, but it wasn't until Team Wellness that I finally did it because I had my teammates encouraging me and pushing me the right way. And I always were ready to jump food. If, but now that's not how that push. He lost over 80 pounds in about a four month period. So it's just life changing again right there in that program. And then finally, um, another strong pillar for us is inclusion through schools. And we have found that our schools program here in Southern California and throughout North America has been one of the most instrumental uh, ways that we are able to teach the youth of how to have an inclusive society. What Dustin shared earlier about programs of working with a unified environment. So again, individuals with and without intellectual disabilities living together and understanding properly what inclusion is um, and really making sure that we as a society know how to work better and stronger together. Um, you know, when this opportunity came up, Dustin and I were very excited because we work together and we've worked together for about five years now, but just to have the opportunity where we can be alongside and representing Special Olympics together, I know means a great deal to me. Um, and the power of what I have seen through Special Olympics of truly changing lives, as Dustin mentioned, there have been athletes that haven't been able to speak, um, that have spoken. Um, we, had a or we had an amazing opportunity at World Games in 2015 where a coach actually called uh, the health area and said, what did you give the athlete? And they said, nothing. We, you know, cleaned out their ears because they had a lot of wax. Well, the athlete won't shut up now and <laughs> will keep talking. And the athlete never spoke before, but the athlete wasn't able to hear until that opportunity. And then most importantly, I know for me, just being able to watch a soccer or football match or being able to watch a track and field competition and able to see 
athletes rejoicing through sport and doing something that they never thought they would be able to before. Yeah, I, and the greatest line that I ever heard from our uh, chairman of the board director for Special Olympics International, Tim Shaver, son of Eunice Candy Shaver, um, he always says, when in doubt, choose to include. So whenever you guys see somebody that's just having a bad day or off on their own, choose to include them. Go up to them and go, hey, can I join you for lunch? Or, hey, you want somebody to talk to? Just take that initiative and make sure that they're included and everything good. They might be going through a bad day and just having that conversation with you would change them and make them smile and all that. That's what Jen and I always do for each other. When we see one person down, we're like, hey, are you okay? And it's like, we just put a smile on our face and we just jump up and get ready to go again. So definitely when in doubt, choose to include. So thank you all. Um, uh, and if we can help you with um, any questions or um, Anything that um, uh, that you may want to know. Oh, a great presentation, um, Dustin and Jennifer. Uh, I was really uh, bored by the fact that you were talking about one point by one million volunteer coaches that you have associated with you. That that is great. That's a phenomenal number by itself. And uh, thank you for sharing this idea of. Uh, not working for, but with the athletes, because most of the time we keep ourselves uh, on on a you know, different pedestal, and we think that we are working for them. But I think this this was an eye opener even for me for that month. So, That's um, wonderful. Um, uh, listening to your experiences, I think where um, being uh, able to feel where where the athlete feels empowered i think that's that's the take the you know the the crowning point of the entire efforts that you do with a particular athlete um, in, in your um, presentation when you're talking about inclusion patterns you talked about schools right so what was the idea of including children in schools and how much has this has that impacted actually the participation in special olympics uh what is the rate that you athletes converting as proper athletes you know so they, they join as enthusiasts or you pick them up based as you said you pick them based on their achievements or how they're performing so how has the rate changed uh, as far as the percentage in Special Olympics is concerned? Uh, well, it's life changing in our schools. Like I went to go visit one of our schools and give a presentation there about how to become a public speaker and help them put their speeches together, just a short thing. And I, I, I was hit home by, I, or I, I was blown away by seeing the connection with the people with uh, ID and, uh, intellectual disabilities on our campus with normal gen, gen ed students on our campus. Like you had the head cheerleader going up to the special education teacher going, hey, I want to take Jacob out to lunch and all this. And, and she's like, okay, um, that's fine. If, 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 let me have him grab his lunch and you guys can go out on the tables. And she's like, no, Miss so-and-so, I want to take him off campus to go have lunch with me and most of my friends. And it's like, that was a power right there, and that's what it's all about, is that inclusion, that connection is why our schools is so important. And that's why it helped us jump up. We had 8,000 athletes 15 years ago, and now we're up to 38,000 athletes. So 15 years, we grew by 30,000 athletes, and that was because of our schools program. We currently have over 80% of our 38,000 athletes are in our schools program. They're getting started at a younger age. We went from a, our average age was 37 years old. Now we're down to 15 year old is our average age of all of our athletes across all of our platforms. Great, great. That that's that's a jump. Yes. So I was just looking through the questions that we were asking. Uh, so, uh, Doctor Ajit had a question John? as well. Yeah. So I'll just quickly uh, Dr. Ajit uh, to the yeah. stage. Dr. Yeah. Ajit, I believe yeah. you had a question. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Very good morning. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you 
to Justin and Jennifer for a wonderful presentation and a very good insight regarding Special Olympics. Uh, I have uh, two questions. First question is for Dustin and the second part for Jennifer. Uh, Dustin, you were mentioning something about young athlete program. We really like to understand what that young athlete program is all about. And Jennifer, we like to understand from you about the young athlete and unified, how it can be successfully implemented in developing nations like uh, India. Well, our, our, our young athletes program is really great. Like I, um, it didn't start till after I joined. I probably started about maybe eight years ago. Is when it got really big. Uh, but before that, before I even joined Special Olympics, I was a coach for three to five year olds, teaching them how to play sports year round. And when I found out we had a young athletes program, which was very similar to that, was amazing to see them uh, at the age of two start socializing and all that. It was really good to see how their social skills improved over those five years in that program to their motor skills improving. Like some of them couldn't even jump over an obstacle that was maybe not even an inch off the ground. They didn't know how to jump an inch high and all that. But just seeing them go from two to three to four-year-old, they might not be able to do the jump. But when they hit a five-year-old, they finally made that inch high jump over the hurdles. So that's why it's so and powerful with our young athletes program. And we have it structured a great way. We can send to you how we have that structured uh, in, in an email and a follow-up and you guys can really see that information firsthand. And Special Olympics International has created a wonderful program that really talks about gross motor skills and how uh, the young athletes can actually learn how to just do basic functions to as Dustin's talking about of jumping and running. And the important thing with young athletes is this can be something done in a home where there could be siblings with and without intellectual disabilities having the opportunity to do this with their siblings. So uh, as you say, developing countries, sh there shouldn't be any barriers because it doesn't take a lot of equipment or uh, you know space in general. It can be done in the home. Um, it can be done in a, in a flat. Uh, it could also be done in a park where it's really bringing um, athletes with and without intellectual disabilities and learning how to move around and uh, improving those motor skills. Um, so it's a really great entry level base um, and SOI has done a phenomenal job building that curriculum. Thank you. So, um, Thank you, Justin, for, uh, for the uh, wonderful answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. I would like to ask, um, I mean, both of you, it's how can we encourage, because um, now we see that sports uh, is becoming, we have having more sports enthusiasts in our country. How can we encourage the sports enthusiasts when it comes to Special Olympics? I mean, what is this? What's the strategy that uh, over the period of time that you guys have found to be best? I think understanding that it is sport, um, and that's the most important part. Uh, during the 2015 World Games, we did take uh, advantage of having a lot of unified opportunities with uh, celebrities and stars as well of uh, individuals taking. It, how popular they are in bringing out and exposing Special Olympics to everyone as well. Um, and I think that made quite an impact on a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, one of my favorite stories that I know about Dustin is one of our colleagues started and became friends with Dustin when he was around 16 playing softball recreationally. And so we were starting Unified even back then, uh, you know, 15, uh, 20 years ago where it's really just participating in sport altogether. So it's taking away the stigma of Special Olympics has to be different than other sports. I would encourage all of the national sports associations in India to offer one competition. If you're having a, you know, if you're having a, a football competition, you know, provide one division that you invite Special Olympics athletes to participate, you know, in that football match as well so that, Special Olympics athletes and also your other uh, football athletes are competing with one another. 
Yeah, I, 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 and then something that we didn't mention in our uh, uh, in our presentation is in India, there's over a million athletes involved in special there in India, and the numbers there is just remarkable. It's a second highest athlete population there in India, just behind China, or I think I just recently passed China. It's just amazing to see. But as Jen said, the one reason why we connected so well is our passion for sports. Sports is the, the one key thing that can bring everybody together, no matter who you are, no matter what background you come from. It's a great way to get everybody involved. So I encourage you guys and challenge you guys to do the same thing that Jen said was bring out a division of special mix athletes. If you want, make it unified. Mix up your regular athletes with your special mix athletes and make teams like that. And let them go out there and play and have some fun. It's just great to see it. Um, we, we do it with our law enforcement officers. We did a uh, unified fight football tournament where we had five officers and five athletes on the team. And just seeing them come together and working so well with each other in a short amount of time was just amazing to see that camaraderie and that team come together. Great. Can I have one question? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, we have been uh, reading a lot of research uh, regarding the Special Olympics sports activities, which talks about uh, in the training. I'm talking about the particular training aspect. We talks about creating inclusion, sharing, caring, and all. But now, uh, post-COVID training systems, the um, standing operating procedures which are coming up which does which talks about not to share the equipment which talks about creating a maintaining a distance while training which talks about uh, not allowing to mingle mingle the athletes while training it talks more on making independent training how about like before that there were a lot of research is like how to connect with the people now for the post covid phase are you thinking on more research how to modify the training which is suitable for post covid 19 and you can have all the important aspects of uh, inclusion and caring and sharing intact absolutely and that's a great question uh we're that is currently what i'm uh in meetings about most of the days right now is are looking at post covid how our world is going to be impacted and what we're able to do um uh, so there are a lot of restrictions and uh, hygiene that we're taking into consideration. One thing I love about Special Olympics is we're, we embrace and we hug and we high five and we shell all of that quite a bit, but we also recognize that we have to work with athletes to take a step back. So while we're developing our programs, and I would be happy to speak with you um, and email with you, you know, offline with this as well, but we're looking at for example, uh, football is one of our fall sports. And we're looking at if we want football, um, instead we take out the, um, if we do plyometrics and keep six feet apart and we're working on more skills and drills so that athletes don't have to pick up the football, the soccer ball and toss it and share it. Same thing with basketballs as well. Are we, you know, what restrictions are in place? Um, there is um, uh, there is a national organization here in America uh, that is looking at youth sport named the Aspen Institute, uh, and they have a risk management document that talks about three levels of introduction uh, introduction for sports going back post COVID nineteen of going from skills to drills to eventual a bit more interaction and then to full on scrimmages. Um, and so we're looking at that in the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic committees, as, long, as well as Special Olympics International for guidance um, as we start to see what this new world will be. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to listen that uh, you are working on to it. Thank you. Point. Great. So um, I think it's been a wonderful session. Thank you so much, Daniel and Jennifer. Thank you, all of you. Anything else that you guys would like to share with us? We are all ears. I just would encourage if you would like, uh, we're both on Special Olympics Southern California's website. Uh, and please reach out to us if you have any questions. I think brainstorming and sharing is always the best way, especially 
uh, during this whole COVID-19 situation as well. Yeah, and something that we definitely take into consideration, as Jen said, we're looking at ways to bring our athletes back together and all that. But we also need to take into consideration with what the CDC said is our athletes with intellectual disabilities are at a higher risk of getting COVID-19. So we're also taking that into consideration when we're looking into how are we going to come back and what ways are we going to come back as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful listening to you people and I'm sure our uh, audiences have learned a lot. Uh, so uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you. Really, really, it, it was a very different kind of a presentation that we had today. Uh, so thank you Bob, and uh, uh, let me please take this opportunity to thank the entire organizing committee and Dr. Narendra Batra, who is also the president of Indian Olympic Association. Mr. Prashant Kushwaha is the chairman of Indian Olympic Education Committee. And Dr. Rajesh Malik, who is the organizing secretary for the webinar and member uh, of the Indian Olympic Education Committee. So with that, I hand over back to Anubhav again. Have a great Thank day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi. And thank you so much uh, to Dustin and Jen as well for that uh, absolutely wonderful, fascinating, brilliant, engaging uh, presentation uh, that they had for all our viewers who are watching on One Place Sports. Uh, we'll kick things off uh, with the second session of the day in about five minutes of time. Uh, to, so get a breather, get a few uh, push-ups, uh, drink some water, and uh, we should be underway in about five minutes. Uh, and we will have Dr. Anjum Padyal, who is the moderator for the next session, to uh, kick things off. Um, and she will be the one establishing what the topic is, as well as uh, who the guest will be for that session. Uh, so uh, be back uh, on our One Play Sports Networks uh, in uh, less than five minutes' time. Stay tuned. Good job, dude. Thanks. You too. Wonderful. Hey, so uh, I mentioned uh, we'll be starting the second session in about five minutes, uh, but a slight change of plans. We'll actually start the second session now. I know all uh, our viewers across all our different platforms uh, who are watching on Facebook, on YouTube, on Hello, on TikTok, on Instagram uh, are eagerly awaiting the start uh, of uh, the second session. Uh, so we will accede uh, to your request. Uh, we have Dr. Anjum Padhyal, who will be moderating the session. As I had mentioned in a couple of minutes back, I'll give a very quick uh, introduction of Dr. Padhyal, uh, and then she can take over. She is the assistant professor at the Department of Physical Education and Sports Sciences at uh, Desh Bandhu College, uh, University of Delhi, academic advisor and Society for Sports and Fitness development dr padyal it's uh, an absolute honor to have you on our one place sports networks i'm pretty sure you have a fascinating structure in mind uh, for this uh, session so you can uh, introduce whatever the topic will be uh, for the session as well as uh, who the the guest is uh, so over to you dr padyal good morning to you all uh, it's a very well a warm welcome to our today's guest speaker from japan professor hisashi Tanada. His topic is Education and Exchange Program for and Beyond Tokyo. So, uh, uh, good morning, Dr. Hisachi. Uh, you have to unmute uh, Professor Hisachi. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Namaste from India. Mm -hmm. Namaste from Japan. A very warm welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Professor Hisashi Senada. He is a professor and TIS chairman, Sukuba International Academy of Sports Studies, Institute of uh, Webinar on Olympism of Olympic Education in the 21st Century. Dr. Hisashi Senada studied 
history of the ancient Olympic Games and modern Olympic Games. He wrote the anthropological history of the modern Greek Olympic Games as a doctoral dissertation from the viewpoint of cultural and education. Dr. Sinada has also studied the philosophy and the achievement of Professor Jigoro Kano, who was a founder of Kodokan Judo and the first International Olympic Committee member from Japan. Dr. Sanada is the director of Center for Olympic Research and Education at University of Tsukuba, founded in 1910 for the 150th anniversary of Jigoro Kano's birth. In 1981, he was MBE of University of Tsukuba and became a professor in 2008 at Faculty of Healthy and Sports Sciences, University of Tsukuba. He went on in 2010 to be a director of Center of Olympic Research and Education. Then in 2014, uh, counselor to CEO of Tokyo Organizing Committee of Olympic and Paralympic Games, as well as Vice President of Pan Olympic Academy. In 2017, he became a member of Commission of Olympic Movement and Japanese Olympic Committee. Once again, I would like to welcome Dr. Sonada, Professor Sonada with us, because we all are waiting to hear flow and through this Tokyo Olympic and post Tokyo Olympic. So all, the floor is all yours. And we would like to welcome from Indian Olympic Association and present participants. Welcome once again. Namaste once again. And thank you very much for your introduction, Dr. Adriel and uh, dear friends. Nice to meet you, and it is a great honor and pleasure for me to be invited to this great conference by the Indian Olympian Association. And uh, I'd like to talk about the education and exchanging program for Tokyo 2020 Games and beyond the Games. I'd like to show my PowerPoint slides. Can you see the slide? Is it okay? And I'd like to we can we can see it clearly. Sanada okay, san, we can see it clearly. Thank you very much. And uh, next slide. Now we move to next slide. Is it okay? And first of all, I must say thank you again. I and my colleagues were invited to India by the Sports Authority of India. That conference is a uh, road to Tokyo 2020 Japanese cultural sensitivity workshop Omotenashi on February 2020. And Mr. Kirin Dijiu, the Minister of the Youth and the Sports, uh, John joined this session and he wore the Japanese kimono, traditional clothes. And we introduced our Japanese culture for the athletes and the staffs who will, who are going to come to Tokyo 2020 games. And we introduced some uh, hospitality and the manner in Japan. And I, we also visited Patiara and we talked about the Japanese culture and the importance of the cultural exchanges with India.
And regarding the Olympic and Paralympic education in Tokyo metropolitan city, which is the host city of the Tokyo 2020 Games, they have uh, they the program is implementing four by four initiatives that is promoted by combining the four themes the values and the spirit of the Olympic and the Paralympic Games, sports, culture, and environment, and learn what to do support. If I focus on the culture, we learn the culture of India, we watch the culture of India, we have some activities with regarding the Indian culture, and uh, support the Indian culture and Indian athletes. This is the framework of the Olympic and Paralympic education in Tokyo metropolitan city. And we set the five mind mindsets. One of them is volunteer spirit. And second is understanding for people with impairments. Three is uh, healthiness through sports. And fourth, self-awareness and pride as a Japanese citizen. And five, reach international sense. And I'd like to show you the summary of the Olympic and Paralympic education in Tokyo. Two thousand three hundred public schools, one million school children, thirty five hours per year over five years. Since 2016, Tokyo has been educating children about the Olympic and Paralympic Games. The goals of the Japanese education system have much in common with the spirit of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. This is why Tokyo has been carrying out experience and activity-oriented Olympic and Paralympic education that correlates with everyday educational activities. Through these educational programs, children develop five key qualities. Volunteer spirit, understanding of people with impairments, healthiness through sports, self-awareness and pride as Japanese citizens, and rich international mindset. Nurturing these five traits will instill in children a spirit of living in harmony and cooperation with others, which will help achieve an inclusive and collaborative society. In order to develop these five qualities, our four major projects include the Tokyo Youth Volunteers Project, designed to foster volunteer spirit and consideration for others. And the SMILE project, designed to deepen mutual understanding of others' personalities and idiosyncrasies. In addition, the Dream in Future project sends Olympians, Paralympians, and other athletes to schools where they interact with, motivate, and inspire children. The Global Friendship Project encourages children to learn about and interact with countries and regions expected to participate in the Games. We have also distributed educational materials, such as Olympic and Paralympic textbooks, and provide various forms of support to schools. In 2020, the children will participate in the Games in many ways, interact with visitors from around the world, and witness the performance of the world's top athletes. They will do everything from voting to choose the game's official mascots, to watching the games in the stadiums. Through such experiences, children will be left with a legacy in both mind and body, 
that nurtures a spirit of living in harmony and cooperation with others. This will lead to achieving an inclusive and collaborative society. Olympic and Paralympic Education in Tokyo. Thank you very much. This is uh, PV for the Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Education Program. And I'd like to focus on the Global Friendship Project. This is a project for the interacting with other countries for students. And uh, the first, they will learn the history, culture of the foreign countries, and they invite the staff of embassies to their school and talk with them about their history, culture of the countries. And some schools sent letters to have exchange with the school in that partner's country. And some of them may have a collaboration as a friendship school. And for example, the Global Friendship School with Qatar, the staff of Embassy of State of Qatar visited a school in Tokyo and talked their culture, climate, and trade. The students welcomed them with singing national anthem of Qatar in Arabic language and asked their students lifestyle and traditional clothes. The lesson expanded students' interest in Qatar's culture and traditions and opened their eyes to the many ways in which Qatar and Japan are deeply connected. I think this is very important to find the connection with the other countries. And next example is a Global Friendship School with Hong Kong. The students from Hong Kong visited the school in Tokyo. And after students of a brass band club welcomed them with a play, they learned about Japanese culture through folding origami paper crafts and framing some traditional toys. And everyone ate school lunch together, and it was an opportunity for the Hong Kong children to see how school lunch is served and cleaned up in Japan, as well as learn about Japanese food. They overcame the language barrier using the facial expressions and gestures. The day was a variable for the both sides, Japanese side, Japanese student, and the students from Hong Kong. This is a Global Friendship Project, and many schools in Tokyo join this program. And uh, we consider the legacy by the education program. One of them is a lifelong legacy that remains in the body and the soul of each child. And to develop initiatives at school as educational activities that can be continued for a long time, even after the games. And to realize inclusive society and 
mutual help through efforts that also involve households and regional community. But now the corona virus came to Japan also, and now we provide some goods and educational materials that the student can learn in their home. And this is one of the goods for the children, elementary school children. They make the mascot of Tokyo 2020 and paint them. And other education materials under COVID-19 for the junior high school and the high school. We are now preparing for such kind of the text. This is a time to consider the followings. What is the value of sports under the COVID-19? And what did athletes express their message to, to us? What is the meaning of sports, exercise, training for us? And what is the Olympic movement in future? This is a good chance to consider this kind of the question. This is a graph for the education program. The education effect to children diffused to households and to regional communities. They have interactive effects each other. And it, this effect affects to be continued to the next generation. And next, I'd like to introduce the host town initiatives. This is a program by the Japanese government, government and uh, this, this is a program for the local town in Japan. And local towns in Japan welcome athletes from all over the world who are taking part in the Tokyo 2020 games. And those host towns will build warm friendship with participating countries through grassroots exchanges. From north to the south, we have about 1,700 local towns in, in all. And uh, now, in the end of May, this May, 498 local towns are registers as host town and 171 counterpart countries. So the 30% of the local towns join this program. And host town support athletes to perform great in Tokyo. The town will cheer the teams at Tokyo 2020 and welcome athletes' visits before or after the games with various events and warm hospitality. And they will host play games and training camps, but this is optional. Already many host towns or 
held the Play Games training camps in the last year. And what is the benefit to have host town for the foreign countries? They can promote the, their countries to Japan or to world. And they have more opportunity to be exposed to Japanese or world media and increase your, their country's publicity to Japan or to the world. And deepen mutual understanding through grassroots exchanging with the citizens, children, inhabitants. And more people in Japan become a fan of their countries and uh, they will experience unique culture of Japanese local towns. Each local town have own local culture, so they can enjoy the Japanese culture. And the long lasting exchange between, between your country and host town and they have great opportunity to deepen cultural and economical exchanges and to develop long-term relationship even after the games and when we focus on athlete from the foreign country they will engage in warm cultural exchanges in host town to deepen mutual friendship. And they will experience Japanese culture, interact with students, enjoy local food, etc. And they utilize the opportunity to introduce your country to Japanese people. And how we can find the relationships with uh, foreign countries. If the local town have relationship for sister city, it is easy. Or already some, some towns host a play camp for other events it is also easy to find the relationship. And otherwise, the citizens discover the historical relationship. They looking back to their history and what the guest visited our city from other countries and what kind of the exchange program or ceremony held at that time. And through this historical relationship, they can find some partner countries. Or the Japanese company located in other, Japanese company located in other countries, in that case, or the same city flower, or the same city motto, or the introduction by someone. So you can find the list of host town in the website. And this is a city's schedules of exchanging program. And before 2020 games, the training camps and the barriers exchanging. And play games, some countries had camps in the host town 
and during the games, many citizens cheer your team at the stadium or public viewing. And post games or beyond 2020, they continue the exchange with athletes, students, citizens in culture, education, economy, etc. This is a scheme hoster initiative. The cabinet secretariat, they organize this program. And if the local government were, was registered as host town, the Japanese government support with some budget to continue this host program. And uh, some example for this host town, the Kasama city in Ibaraki prefecture near from my house now, and they host Ethiopian and Ethiopian junior athletes visited this city to participate in host town activities. Joint team of Ethiopian junior athletes and Japanese junior athletes participated in Kasama Junior High School Ekiden Relay Competition. Ekiden Relay is a long dis distance relay race, the traditional sports in Japan. This is like that. And uh, they also visited local junior high school to deepen friendship with Japanese students. They tried the Japanese calligraphy, writing the letters, and uh, they joined English class in junior high school, and they enjoyed the sports competition with students. And this is uh, Mishima village, the south of Japan, the island, small island. And uh, this is a host town for Guinea. And uh, why this host town were re registered? The reason is that the world famous master of jambe drum from Guinea has been visiting Mishima village almost every year to teach jambe to children in Mishima. This is a jambe drum, the traditional instrument in Guinea. And uh, every year, the master of jambe visited this island and teach, taught the brain how to play the jambe. And the jambe is now played at various moments in the village. When the ships came to this island, the citizens welcomed the visitors training the jambe. And uh, this Mishima town, Mishima village, wants to have exchange after the Tokyo 2020 games, inviting Guinea Olympians to the village. This village is far from Tokyo, but they, they can touch the Olympic movement. And another example is Niza city in Saitama prefecture. It is near from Tokyo. They are this town is a host town for the Brazil, and the citizen made the national flag of Brazil with the papers. This is uh, made by papers. And this national flag was given to the ambassador to Japan. And pre-camp, 
were hauled in this needs the city. The world relay race at Yokohama was held in last year. And the Brazilian team had pre camp in Niza Athletic Ground and they got gold prize in that world world real race. And in town, Japanese students were invited to Brazil school games in 2019. So two junior high school students and two high school students joined this Brazil school games. It was very good experience for these young students. And I'd like to talk the Hosotan for India. One of the local town is Okuizmo. This is a small town of 13,000 people situated in the West Japan's Shimane Prefecture. Here, this is a, a Okuizmo town. Tokyo is here. Uh, 900 kilometers from Tokyo. And this town has made a name for itself as one of the strongest bases of hockey in Japan. This town alone has produced four Olympic level and more than 50 national level players over the past two decades. At present, 12 Okuizmo based hockey players are active under the national hockey team. The students in this Okuizmo town, they play hockey from the elementary school days. And sometimes the junior high school hockey, hockey club got gold medal in Japan, number one in Japan. Why they, they could got win, get win and the Students from India who have ever played hockey in India came to the high school in this town and they taught the student how to play hockey, what is the technique for hockey training. So many Indian students in Japan came to this town. And they, some of them are Okuizumo's hockey stars. Nine former students of high school in this town participated in the 18th Asian Games in Jakarta, where both the men and the women's team won gold medal for the first time in the history of Japanese hockey. With this historic win, the expectations towards the team's performance at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics will be highly anticipated. And the men's team also, uh, five, men, five members are from this town. This is a national team. That's why this town applied for the host town for India. As Japan's Asian counterpart, the national India hockey team is not only ranked one in Asia, both men and women. India had been one of the most successful hockey teams in the world. 
they are an example of world class hockey, which the town of hockey looks up to as an inspiration. For Okuizumo town, hockey is not just a sport, but a way of life in this town. Then the, they, uh, all, they were already prepared to invite hockey members from India. But it would be postponed to the next year. And in this town, uh, they held some events to introduce uh, Indian culture. The left one is a picture for school lunch. They sometimes eat Indian foods as school lunch. This is curry. And for the citizens, such kind of the events to introduce uh, Indian culture were implemented. This is also the fruits of India. We Japanese like curry very much. And another town, host town for India is uh, Kurobe city in Toyama prefecture north east of japan and uh, this town is a host town for indian archery team and the mayor of the city visited the ambassador to japan indian ambassador and made mou for host town. And uh, Indian staff visited this town, this, this city, and they watched the field of archery in this city. This city have a very good field for archery. And many students Many young men are practicing the archery. And they held the Indian festival and introduced the Indian foods. It seems very delicious. And for this host town programs, the NHK, the public broadcast company, opened the website of Let's Cheer for the World. There are all of the countries in the world, Singapore, Slovenia, Iceland, Afghanistan, USA, etc. And if I put in, enter in this site, how, how shall we cheer for these people? It shows like that. So I'd like to show the India. Yeah. 
जब ही प्रसिद्ध अभिनेत्री और अभिनेता नाच गाना करते हैं तो सारे लोग उनको बहुत पसंद करते हैं अभी हम आपको दिखाते हैं कि नारे कैसे लगाते हैं बोलो भारत माता की जय बोलो भारत माता की जय बोलो भारत माता की जय कैसे लगे हमारे नारे आपको भारत माता की जय हाहा नारू इंदोनी एको अरे ये मतलब है हमें बहुत खुशी होगी जब आप भारतीय खिलाड़ियों के लिए नारे लगाएंगे बोलो भारत माता की जय बोलो भारत माता की जय बोलो भारत माता की जय Thank you. If the Indian athlete come to Japan, the host town people say, Boro Bharat Mataki J. And uh, finally, what legacy shall we hand about to the next generation we must consider and through this kind of the exchange program and sports, culture, education sightseeing, inclusive society, vitalization of the community or the local town, and resilience and recovery from the disaster, include, including the COVID-19. And I think that education and exchanging program promotes the solidarity and peace. The idea of human society that no one can oppose you is that oneself and others flourish by mutual compromise and assistance of every member of society. This is a word by Jigoro Kano, the first IOC member from Japan. And Pierre de Coubertin told to educate young people through sports in a spirit of better understanding between each other and uh, of friendship, thereby helping to build a better and more peaceful world. And finally, Mahatma Gandhi, the highest moral law is that we should unlimitedly work for the good for humankind. Thank you for your attention. This is a capital by the Thomas Baha, written with a Thank you, Professor Senada. Yes. That was a very enlightening. Mm -hmm. And with a broad wisdom, uh, your talk and your session. And yes, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Mm -hmm. We right? would like to hear these slogans when our team will reach to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And let's cheer for the world. In this uh, uh, state of pandemic, we must cheer each and every country. We all are suffering with the same scenario of pandemic. So this is the time to cheer and wait for the Olympic to be held for peace and for harmony and for friendship. Uh, 498 host towns 
Wow, that's amazing. That's an amazing preparation and that's an amazing thought for exchange of all the culture across the globe with different different countries making the hometown host town and uh, sharing their culture, sharing their food, sharing their festivals. That's so amazing vision. I must congratulate Japan for having always having such a vast vision. Thank you. Uh, Ethiopia, Guinea, and Brazil. Mm -hmm. They are working as a co-team, practicing uh, different, different games and uh, different, different, uh, uh, pract uh, different, different culture, always learning with that. And uh, Corby has a archery hub. Wow. I would like to share with you I am HOD in Desh Bandhu College, University of Delhi. My archery team has 385 medals oh. for past five years. Mm -hmm. Great. And I would definitely request to my government, Indian Olympic Association, uh, Dr. Narendra Ji, to somehow uh, organize an exchange program of my team with Japan so that my student can also be benefited with this uh, exchange programs. Thank you. Uh, yes, hockey is our national game. Yes, we have very exclusive skills. We have exponential players and exchanging our student skill with teaching them Japanese student. That's a very uh, great vision, having a, you know, exposure to both the nations about practicing hockey in Okyo Zuma. Mm -hmm. I have visited many times to Tokyo in World mm -hmm. Championship Suzuki World Cup, aerobic gymnastics, and I love, I'm in love with Japan. Mm -hmm. That's a very that's amazing amazing. country. The most, uh, the thing I like, that's a discipline. And the citizenship you have inculcated in every citizen. That's the amazing part of mm -hmm. world. Thank you very much. Said, thank you. Pierre de Coubertin said, the future of our civilization does not rest on politics and economics foundation. It wholly depends on the direction given to education. And through Olympic education, we are inculcating the excellence, the respect, and the friendship. We are looking forward to see Tokyo Olympic to be hosted as soon as possible so that the whole world can be together, can be cheered, can see the light of the new life in this pandemic. I would like uh, to uh, have a question answer round. Uh, I think we have to take one question. So, Yes, Abhi, uh, Ashish Kumar Rawat, you are welcome to ask your question. Thank you, Professor Sanada. I hope uh, you remember me. I am from the yes. first legacy program that you hosted in 2014. So I hope you are doing well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Professor Sanada. And uh, I would really like to ex uh, show the, the, the kind of experience uh, that we have, the enriching culture that Japan had. And especially the experience of the Omitonashi was very wonderful. And uh, I can really see the Olympic and the Paralympic education movement going forward in the country. Uh, professor, it has been a very well-crafted program that I'll say that uh, when you talked about uh, the school education program, you, where you have inculcated the five friends with five peers, with five mind projects and with the, your uh, five mindsets. So that is incredible of how the Olympic value education get into the complete process. Mm -hmm. So now my question to you is, uh, what are the changes that you have seen in your students post you uh, given them this five year program in terms of their knowledge to Olympic and Paralympic education? That is my first question. Mm -hmm. The second question is how you are planning to take this education legacy forward post the Olympic education of Post the Olympics are home in the country. Mm -hmm. That's it from my Sanada. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I 
I couldn't uh, hear clearly, so would you please uh, question again? Slowly and clearly, sorry. Uh, sorry, I can't hear. Right. I repeat my question, Professor Sarah. Yeah, you have to repeat yeah. it, right. So what are the changes that you have seen in your student post you introduced when you introduce Paralympic and all the all the Yes. Yes, I'm doing that again. Okay. So my question is what are the changes that you have seen in your students post you introduce Olympic and Paralympic education to them? That is my first question to you. And uh, you mean the what is the effect of the for the society on the students uh, for by the Olympic uh, Am I clear now, Anju? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yes, I think that uh, now we have a pandemic uh, disaster now, and uh, the. COVID-19 is uh, yes. great and uh, the COVID-19 divides the nation yes. and uh, humans and uh, every society is now that we can uh, make relationship with sports and uh, some of the values for the sports and the Olympic and Paralympic games, the emotion that we feel excellence, uh, friendship, and respect, that can combine the divided nations, human societies. So this is the uh, most important part of the Olympic and the Paralympic education in every country is about now. I believe like that. Is it okay? Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the next question is it please again. Uh, do you have another question, Ashish? You are not no. audible. Ashish, you can't be heard very clearly. Still, still not audible, uh, mm. Ashish. Thank you so much, Professor Sarada. Yeah, thank you so much for your answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ashish, did you have a second question as well? Uh, how are you? How are? Yes, it is the second part of the question of uh, how are you planning to educate to take for. Hello, am I audible now? Yeah, your voice is breaking. Am I audible? Audible? Yes, Ashish. Yeah, you are audible. Yes. Doctor Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I write my question? You can Am write I audible it. Audible now. You are audible, but if you want, uh, you can write your question as well, just in case, and I can read it out. So yes, I have write... a part of it, uh, but it's okay. That's absolutely fine. Professor Sanada has almost answered that too. Lovely, but okay. you can you can still write it. We have a few minutes. You can still write your question in the private chat, and I can read it out. Uh, Till then, I will ask the read. question. Yes, I will Dr. ask Padia, a question. I would like to request uh, Professor Sanada that our uh, uh, Honorable Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi ji is going to bid for, I think, 2034 Olympics. Mm -hmm. yes. So we would like your uh, suggestion, your guidance, what India should do to start preparing way ahead of time. 
Now, okay. Uh, yeah. Am I audible now? Yes. 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 I'll do that. Okay. You have a great philosophy like, like Gandhi and right. uh, so, Tagore. So, how are you planning to take the uh, education legacy forward, especially in schools? Hmm. Ashish, just just hold on for a second. Uh, Ashish, uh, Dr. Padyal had a question. You might not hear this in time because there's a, a little bit of a lag. Uh, but Ashish, just hold off uh, for a second. And uh, Dr. Sanada, carry on with the answer. You were talking about Gandhi and Gandhi's philosophy and legacy. Yes, for the Indian, the Olympic Games in Indian, I hope that you have a great philosophy by the Gandhi and the Tagore and the etc. So I hope the new Olympism would be born from India for the peace and the, the, for the next generation. Uh, Indians need to be in the most peaceful uh, ideas they have. So I hope this is not the west side, but the Asian side we need to collaborate and make the new uh, Olympic. I, I hope and I believe. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. That's an amazing belief mm. on uh, India from your side, from the Japan side. Yeah, India is leading the world and people are looking at India right now with all the hopes and we hope uh, with this leadership in our country, we are going to uh, make our new marks in Olympic, in peace, in friendship throughout the world and all over across the countries. Thank you, Dr. Prof uh, Professor Sanada. Uh, over to Ashish uh, or Anubha. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, so, right. Uh, so we have about one minute left uh, until uh, we finish this. Uh, so I think we can conclude proceedings. Uh, Ashish, you had mentioned okay. that uh, Dr. Sanada had answered your second question as well while answering your first question. So I think uh, we should be uh, good to conclude uh, this session. I have one request from Dr. Padyal, from uh, Sanada San, from Ashish as well. How about all of us, you know, given the fact that we're in different locations, different parts of the world as well. How about all of us just do a namaste in unison? <laughs> so I can say three, two, oh, one, wow. and we can do a namaste in okay. unison. Uh, Ashish's namaste might come slightly late only because, you know, there's a little bit of a <laughs> lag, but uh, but that's that's not right. a problem. So Ashish three. can start early. <laughs> Ashish can start early. That's a good suggestion. Oh, he started early. There you go. So right. three, two, one. Namaste. Namaste. Boro. Namaste. Bahala Mataki Jai. Jai. Bahala Mataki Jai. Why don't... Why don't we do that as well? So I'll say three, two, one, and all three of us can say Bharat Mata Ki Jai, right? Uh, because Great. in many ways, uh, this uh, this was very evident and clear through uh, Dr. Sanada's beautiful presentation and some of the beautiful videos right. that he had lined up for us. Uh, so three, True. two, one, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Fantastic, fantastic. There you go. We got, we got Ashish's, uh, we got Ashish's uh, Bharat Mata Ki Jai time as well. Lovely. So uh, we'll we'll conclude proceedings. <laughs> we'll conclude proceedings on uh, that note. Uh, this was a fabulous session. Thank you so much to uh, to Sanada San for this beautiful presentation. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Padyal as well for uh, moderating this uh, so effortlessly, seamlessly, uh, smoothly. And uh, Ashish, uh, fantastic question. Uh, it. De definitely goes to show that Dr. Sanada had a had a very uh, big effect uh, on uh, you, on your understanding, on your values as well. The fact that, you know, both of you have such a good relationship and your question was uh, extremely valuable for everyone who was watching as well. So we'll conclude proceedings on that note. Uh, for those who, those of you who are watching uh, this live coverage of this international webinar on our One Play Sports Networks, stay with us uh, in uh, in a minute or in fact, just now, we'll uh, we'll kick things off uh, with uh, the third session of the day, and uh, the next session is going to be moderated by Dr. Gautam Mukherjee, the very eminent Dr. Gautam Mukherjee, who's the CEO of Sportify and uh, is based out of both India and Singapore. She keeps shuttling between uh, India and Singapore, and uh, Dr. Mukherjee will give you a better sense of. Uh, who uh, the speaker is for this session, as well as uh, what the topic is that will be discussed over the course of the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes or so. The structure of the presentation will remain exactly the same. So we have about 40 to 45 minutes for the presentation, and we leave about uh, 5 to 10 minutes for Q&A at the very end. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee, the stage is set for you to take over from me now. 
Thank you so much, Anubhav, uh, for your kind Thank introduction. You so Yes, uh, it's really a pleasure to have uh, me. Um, it's, it's an honor to be a part of uh, such movement. Uh, by the way, am I audible to you? Uh, you're you're very clearly uh, all right, audible, Doctor Mukherjee. Right. And we can see your beautiful uh, face as well. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so, um, very good morning to everyone, and uh, I trust uh, you, your family, and your loved ones are all um, are all in good health and uh, safe. Uh, those who are watching us on live on different platforms. Uh, first of all. Uh, uh, inter, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the entire team uh, for the successful uh, arrangement of this international webinar on Olympism and Olympic education in 21st century organized by Indian Olympic Association under the leadership of Honorable President Dr. Narendra Batram and Indian Olympic Education Committee member Mr. Prashant Kushwa, who is the organizing committee also of this member and uh, Mr. Rakesh Malik, who is the organizing secretary. Um, let me give you a brief about what uh, uh, my take on this entire thing uh, so that I set the context right for the speakers and also for the viewers. Uh, my name is Dr. Gautam Mukherjee, introduced by Yavinav. I'm the chief executive of Spotify. Uh, Olympism is a philosophy of life, uh, exalting and combined in a balanced whole, the qualities of body, will and mind. Uh, blending sport with culture and education, Olympism seeks to create a way of life based on the joy found in effort the education value of good example and respect for universal fundamental ethical principles. Uh, towards Spotify's endeavor of impacting sports at grassroots level and education, we believe and follow the spirit of Olympism and also our entire effort is actually based on the Olympic creed of larger participation. With the spirit of Olympism, um, we deliver end-to-end -end sports education program in more than 200 plus schools across India, along with community sports development, sports academies, grassroots sports, sports education training. Uh, so it's really a pleasure because a lot of our endeavors are so aligned with the Olympism and the spirit of Olympic education. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome today's speaker, Ms. Ofra Abrahami. She is the founder and chairman and board of Mamanit from Israel. Welcome, Ofra. Hello. Hello. Very good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK. Hi. How are you? I'm good, Ofra. And welcome, and I trust all are good in your family, health, and uh, you're safe. Thank you. I'll give you a brief introduction of uh, Mamanit. Uh, I was going through your website also, Afra, and I'm very excited um, with your vision. Mamanit impacts the social status of women by creating opportunity to participate in sports. Uh, mothers to participate in sports started with this powerful and impacting thought. Uh, Mamanet organizes Mother's League, which is the largest women's league and the third most popular sports brand in Israel. Uh, Mamanet has uh, thousands of active mother players who participate in uh, close to 1150 plus teams located in municipalities in Israel and all across the world. Ofra devotes her life to promote Mamanet's life philosophy, where mothers should be able to belong to a sports team and thereby lead a healthy and active lifestyle. Uh, what an impacting thought, Ofra. And as such, those mothers become a personal example and a role model for their children and family. They become strong physically and mentally, and they become to be a leader and start to hold positions in the local municipalities' leadership avenues. Mothers who participate in Mamanate have proved their ability to build a strong community, which become a platform to emphasize school pride, good sportsmanship, professional competitions, and enhancing community building and mutual aid. I am personally very excited to hear a lot about you because this is a very powerful and impacting thought that must have started. Um, and yes, it has taken a major shape and I'm sure it is it is impacting not only socially but also at grassroots sports. Ofna, we are very privileged to have you with us today. Uh, I would like to um, um, take on the stage and share your views, thoughts and the presentation. Over to you, Ofra. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, before I continue, I just want to uh, say a few thanks. Uh, so it's a privilege for me to, you know, to be part of this uh, webinar and this uh, conference. Uh, it's an honor for me. Um, it's not that obvious because we are talking about the uh, amateur sport and, you know, and the, but the Olympism values, it fits absolutely to Mamanet and I will uh, represent it later. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Narinder Dhruv Bata, president of the Indian Olympic Association, and to Mr. Prashant uh, Kushawa, Kushawa, 
chairman of the Indian uh, Olympic Education Committee, and Dr. Rakesh Malik, uh, the organizing uh, secretary in the, of the webinar and the member of the Indian uh, Olympic Education Com Committee. Um, I would like first, I would like to um, uh, show a clip, short clip about MamaNet so we can gain an idea of what it is and then I can, it's easily to talk about after. So shall I share the screen? Uh, or just go ahead. The, the, I'll try to put the, do you see it? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. You see, you see it? We don't, we don't see it as yet, ma'am. Did you, did you click on share screen? No. Ma'am, I think, I think the video is playing on your screen. It's not being shared as yet. So we can, we can hear the audio, but we can't uh, see what you're playing. Uh, so if you could just share your screen, I think we should be able to see it then. Yes, one minute. Yes, ma'am. Oh, at the bottom, there is an icon of share screen. Yes, one minute, I'll be, okay. Uh, screen sharing is easiest with two months. And then you click on share screen again. You'll see a blue okay. button. And then, uh, do you, is this a presentation where you have the video embedded? No, it's a... It's a tab? It's, uh, let me see. Now you can see it? Not yet. Maybe so once you once you select once you select the video once you select the video, then you click on share screen again and then we will be able to see it. One minute, sorry. Um, no problem. So exactly, you were on the right track. So you simply follow the same procedure. You were on the right track, and then uh, once I see it, I'll let you know. So you don't see the share share screen. Uh, one minute. Not yet. Ma'am. Now you can see. What is yet, ma'am? Is this? Oh, yes, I can see it now. I can see it now. Brilliant. Okay. Right. So we can see what you are seeing on your screen. Okay. Now there you, can you go, ma'am. We can see it now, ma'am. Lovely. Okay. So I'll start it. Okay. Oh, yes. You can just click on the enlarge button. Yeah. Right. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. מאמנט זה דרך חיים, ומאמנט שינתה לי את החיים. אני עצמאית יותר, אני עברתי שינוי, התחלתי להעריך יותר את הזמן איכות שלי. מאמנט זו קהילה של עשרות אלפי אימהות, שבעצם משחקות משחק שהוא כדורעף שמותאם לאימהות. הקבוצות של האימהות נבנות סביב בית הספר של הילדים. זה מתאים לכל אישה. באמת, כל אימא יכולה. ופתאום אה, פגשתי עולם חדש, שאפשר אה, למצות את עצמך, ואפשר לעשות למען עצמך, גם בלי לפגוע בקריירה, בילדים, בבית. נשים זה משפט קבוע שלהם, אין לי זמן. מאמא נט שמה את האימא במרכז המגרש, שבעצם האימא הפכה להיות כוכבת, והמשפחה היא מעודדת. כשאני הצטרפתי למאמא נט, כל הבית עשה שינוי. הבת שלי נחשפת לזה, והיא אומרת, שאני ההשראה שלה. פתאום הספורט הופך להיות משהו מרכזי בבית. אני הפכתי לאמא טובה יותר. אני מהווה דוגמה לילדים שלי. הם באים לעודד, והם תומכים. זה היה כמה ימים אחרי היום הולדת. לא רוצה כלום, לא כסף, לא מתנות, לא כלום. אני רוצה שאימא תצטרף לממנת. והיא עשתה איזושהי הפתעה. הלכה ונרשמה. זה בעצם לא עוד חוג. מאמנט זה, זה קהילה. המארג הזה של החברות שנוצר, היא יצר משהו אחר. אנחנו קבוצת תמיכה לכל דבר. וסביב הפעילות הזאת יש אין סוף פעילויות חברתיות, התנדבותיות, קהילתיות. יש לנו בכפר הוסטל, בית בחורש. בעלי ואני החלטנו שאנחנו רוצים לתת להם מקום גם, כן? ולעשות להם אימונים. כל הזמן מרגש, כל אימון מחדש. זה פשוט שם, וכל רעיון וכל דבר שאת רוצה לעשות, את יכולה לעשות. היה טורניר, מצד ימין הייתה קבוצה יהודית. מצד שמאל הייתה קבוצה של בית חנינה, ורק רשת עם חורים הפרידה בין שתי הקבוצות. חייכו אחת לשנייה, כיף שזה היה ביניהם, ואז הבנתי מה מנת. זה מעבר לרשת. זו הגדולה של מאמנט, שהיא בעצם עוצמתית, היא מגיעה לכל מקום, זה משהו שהוא הרבה הרבה יותר מהמשחק עצמו. וזה שדרג אותי כאדם, השתנתי, פשוט השתנתי. 
Okay. And can you see me? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. We can we can see it clearly. We can see your presentation clearly. Okay. Um right. Just a minute. Sorry. Uh, no problem, ma'am. Take your time. Okay. Uh, okay. So now I can share my uh, PowerPoint. Do you see this? Yeah. Yes, okay. ma'am. We are seeing it. Uh, okay. Except that currently, your if you could zoom in a bit, if you could perhaps change it to presentation mode. So in the bottom ah, right hand yeah. corner of yes, your PPT, yes, sure. you see sure. this. Uh, yeah. Then yes. we'll be able to see the full screen. It's okay. There you go, ma'am. That's brilliant. That's perfect. You're all set. Uh, go for it. Okay, thank you very much. So my name is uh, Ofra Abramovich and I'm the founder of MamaNet, uh, which is a league for mothers. And it was uh, initiated 15 years ago uh, in my uh, city, a uh, small city in Israel. Um, and it becomes uh, by me going to some activity that a, friends of, a friend of mine asked me to come with her. And I always said to her, no, I don't have time. I'm very busy with the children, with uh, uh, making dinner and homework with them. Always excuses why not to go with her. And actually, after a few times that she encouraged me, I said, OK, I will go uh, with her and I will see what it is. And uh, so she will leave me alone after that. And um, I went, uh, at, she told me to be ready at uh, Tuesday, 8.30 in evening time. And I prepared everything on time and I was ready uh, to go with her. And when I went to there and I start to play with the team after I'll say what is the game, I realized two things. One of them was that me and only me is responsible for my set of priority. It means that if I decided to go out at 8.30 at night with my friend to a, an activity, I can arrange everything ahead and be ready by that time. So no one will tell me what is the set of priority and how to make the, the, the schedule, my schedule. I, the only one that's responsible for this. So if my set is priority is different, I will act different. And the second thing that happened when I went there was that I was start to playing with a team and um, I just felt that I get back to age of 16 when I was free with no children and I have nothing to worry about and I have time for myself. And when I set a point, all the team cheer me up. And even when I didn't set a point, all the team cheer me up. And it was like a fun place to be. And, and it, it just hit me. And when I came home, I said, wow, one minute. I, I miss this time. I want to be part of a, a, a team. I want to do sport, not alone together. I, I need to do something about it. And then I decided to uh, initiate and uh, to found the, the MamaNet. It's a league for mothers. And um, I went to my mayor of my city and I said to him, uh, I asked for a meeting and I said to him, I want to have a league for mothers. And he stares at me and he said to me, okay thank you and just send me out from his office but i didn't give up and i always nag him and went to him and even i called his wife and i said to her tell him to have a mama net and look for mothers because it will be the best uh, thing that he will do and after a while he uh, <laughs> just uh, couldn't uh, resist my uh, nagging and he called me to his office and he said okay what do you need and i said just a uh, sport holes um, and uh, to start to uh, have the mothers. And he allowed me to go to each school and to each classes, all the classes in each school in my city and to tell them that we are going to have a mama net, a league for mothers and every mother will get a t-shirt and medal and stuff like this. And uh, um, this was the beginning. Now, wh why why is the the mama net is so uh, important and now it's so successful and it got uh, so many um, mothers. So first of all, we are the biggest uh, women league in Israel. Um, more than ten thousand mothers are playing in this uh, mama net, 
and we are the third branch in Israel after soccer ball, basketball, and mamanet. This is how significant is the, the, the meaning of mamanet because uh, many, muddy, many, many homes have players, mother, that uh, playing mamanet. So what are the values of mamanet? Why, why is it become so popular? So first of all, um, we said that every mother can, and this is a very strong value. It's a value. It's not a, 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 just a statement. It's a value. Because while you say every mother can, you allowed so many mothers that never touch a ball, never get to the court, never did a, a team sport, never have time for this to get to the, to the field again or for the first time. And we don't care what her religion, what her social status, what her age, what is their height, what is the way, we don't care. You are mother, you are in. And the model is that uh, each, uh, the mother uh, create a team according to the um, a school that the children are learning. So if uh, my uh, daughter is uh, in school Osishkin, for example, in Israel, my team name is Osishkin. So I represent the school by uh, being a Mamanet uh, player. So this brings to the triangle of uh, school, mothers, and the children. We are together. We, we represent in a good uh, 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 statement the, the Mamanet. And the, the, the second thing is that the mother becomes the star of the, of the family. She is the star now in sport, and all the family come to cheer her. So we change the rules. Usually the father is the role model for uh, sport, not because he's always doing sport, maybe he's watching the, the sport channel, but yet he's always the, the uh, role model for sport. And we change it. We uh, put the mother and she's a, a very, very uh, obligated to this. So she, she don't miss a, a training. And if we have a... She have a very difficult time at the, at the job and the, she's very tired. She never give up. She's going to the training. And when the children see his mother putting the knee, the knee pad and taking the ball and going every, every week for training and they playing, we don't have to tell them to do sport. They know that they should uh, do sport because the mother is doing it. I can do it also. And uh, I have to mention that uh, in many places that there is a Mamanet uh, uh, league, the number of children that attending the sport clubs raising up every time because either the children wants to be like mother and go to play, do, do sport, or the mothers realize how important the sport is and they uh, force the children to, um, uh, to do sport. And this is, uh, and by the way, uh, usually at age of uh, 12, uh, a lot of um, girls uh, start to leave the sport because uh, they become, uh, they want to have more social life and to go out at a uh, Friday evening and uh, they start to get muscles and they don't want, them, they, they want to look like women, not uh, like uh, strong uh, shoulders and uh, whatever. And they start to quit the sport. And when you have mothers, a uh, mama net mother at home, and she realized how important the sport is, she will force her girl to stay to the, the, the sport because it's very important for all the values that the sport uh, is giving to us. And uh, for me as a mother, um, giving my children the sport, uh, the, the values of life of uh, winning or losing or uh, stay in order or listen to uh, instructions or uh, be a part of a team or sometimes to give up, sometimes to, sometimes to be a captain, all the values uh, that uh, we want for life. Uh, I want my children to, to gain it by the sport field. I think this is the best way for children to, to understand the, the values of uh, life. So this is uh, very important. And um, when the mother is doing sport, all the family get benefit. 
because while she is doing sport and realize that she wants to jump higher and run faster for the ball, she start to uh, watch what what she's eating and she start to um, uh, cook healthy. And while the mother is cooking healthy, all the family get benefit. And then when the mother is a, is caring about a active way of life and healthy way of life, all the family get benefit from this because we saw it in many, many families when the mother come to Mamanet, all the family changed their way of life, their way of seeing the sport, the importance of sport and all this stuff. So, So while many, many uh, people ask me why mothers, it's a very crucial, very crucial to, to implement the change because the mother is a change agent of the family. And while she's decided to do something, all the family is uh, getting uh, either involved or got benefit or influenced by this. So this is a, a, a role model uh, for them and uh, very important. So um, this is how uh, uh, we started it. And I, I just added um, very few um, um, sentences about Oli why Olympism and MamaNet is like equal. Because the value of, Mama, of uh, Olympism is loving the sport, respect, friendship, and excellen uh, excellency by doing the best that you can. You not always have to win, but you have to do the best you can. This is very important. And combining sport with culture and education to create a way of life based on, on joy and of effort, educational values, social responsibility, and respect. And by that, we're creating a better world for our children. And I think that mothers, for me also, again, my, my, my title as a mother is to create a better world for my children. And MamaNet, and I'll show you it in a, in a few minutes uh, in other uh, um, um, uh, spot that we see how we do it. But I have to mention that um, mothers, uh, the MamaNet mothers, players start in very like a 30, 35 uh, year of age or maybe earlier. It depends uh, when you start to be a mother. But... We start to participate the league by that time that um, a professional athletes or players hang their shoes, which means that the mama net is against all the physiology of sport <laughs> because we, we become, after we finish all the, the titles in life, we start to do the sport uh, again. So it's very important to understand that we don't come only for winning. The way... Of doing it the way to the court and the way from the court outside this is what important what values we share while going to the uh, court before we play while we play and after we play and this is very crucial uh, because sometimes we mix uh, people come to play so they always want to win and we they don't care for nothing but winning okay I'm a mother and I'm a player and, and I want to win But I know that I have more obligation other than that. So combining all the values that the Olympism share, this is what creates MamaNet, uh, the, the very popular and very important and very uh, crucial for others. And another point that we found out during those years that um, um, MamaNet uh, players can become the best coaches for children. And why? Because if those children go to a special branch, soccer, handball, uh, rugby, whatever, and they start with professional uh, coach, the demand from them to uh, be professional, be the first, be one, be, and if not, you go out, you sit you on the bench and whatever. I think it's good only for the best, but it's not good for all of them. And not all of us will be the best player and the way we win a, gain a, an Olympic medal. But yet, all of us need to do sport and needs to gain values. And, and I think that mothers that share these uh, uh, values with the children and, and like understand them and give them the uh, passion for sport 
as a sport, not as a, a medal. I think this is the best uh, infrastructure for those children to raise up to be a professional uh, players. Before you first have to love what you do, and then from this, you can be the best. And uh, in Israel, for example, many mothers uh, sharing their values uh, in, in classes because we, are, uh, we speak Olympism. Our values is Olympism and we share it with our children or in the other classes. And it's very, very important. And we can see that the children are influenced by this. And I think that if you want to raise up the, the awareness of uh, sport and the importance of sport, this is the, the best way. Not to mention that by having 10,000 mothers playing in Israel, in Mamanet, you add 10,000 women to sport field. And this is very important. It's not very obvious because we know that uh, also, I don't know how it's in other countries, but in Israel, the sport is dominated 99% by men in the sport department, the head of the sport department, the coaches, the uh, head of uh, associations, and all of them are men. And adding more women to the field by first by players and later being uh, coaches and referees and all the um, professional staff, I think it's a role changing. It's a, it's a game changer. And this is very, very important. And it's influence uh, in Israel also, the, the sport field. Um, okay, what is the game? We talk about too, uh, too, too long about uh, what's Mamanet, what, what is the game? But I have to mention that the game is very important, but it's not the crucial part of uh, Mamanet. It's, it's a, a part of the whole uh, picture. So the game is it called Newcomb because it was invented in uh, the United States two, 200 years ago. And it was um, in University of Newcomb, Louisiana. And the, the, the um, physical education uh, um, teacher invited it and she started playing it. And uh, it was and then from there it was moved for our uh, 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 other countries. And for example, in, uh, the, in South America, a lot of men playing uh, the, this game and they call it Kashi ball because you catch the ball. You are allowed to catch the ball for one second and then throw it. And all the rest of the rules are the same as uh, volleyball. This is the only difference. Um, and then they, it moves to uh, England and they call it throw ball because the serve that you do, it's throwing it and not uh, hitting it like in uh, volleyball. The, the big difference is that in volleyball, you hit the ball and in uh, Mamanet, you catch a ball. And this allows many um, mothers to uh, uh, play it because you don't need any um, prior experience and you don't have to, you know, uh, practice 10,000 times a day in order to be the perfect serve. You just catch it and throw it. So this is why uh, it's easy to uh, uh, gain it. Um, so now, uh, after we spread it out in Israel, uh, many countries in around the world start to ask to hear about it and to see what's going on. What, what is it? Uh, what is it? Why, why it's so attractive in Israel? And uh, so the head of the CSIT, as you can see. Uh, uh, is the head of the biggest uh, 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 sport for all uh, and the uh, working place uh, sport organization uh, with like uh, 22 million uh, members. And uh, he decided to have Mamanet as a, an official branch in the world sport games that they have uh, every two years. And why? Because uh, in Italy and in Austria and the USA, they have a lot of uh, sport branches. Wh why Mamanet? And this is exactly uh, what is the values, because it's a league for mothers and mothers bring with them different set of values. When I go to play in the world sport games, it's like the Olympic games. I don't come only for winning. I appreciate the time that I have to go out from uh, my home to leave uh, the children and the husband, and they know how to behave when I go out because I teach them 
by going every week to the training and the uh, uh, and to have time for myself and playing and having fun and you should see in those games the winner and the losers dancing together and we don't care and we have fun and we go out and we share our experience together and we come home happy very happy because the the Uh, in this age of uh, life and this uh, circles of life that we are always stuck as mothers, having the opportunity to do sport and to be with friends and to share values and to do good things for others, this is the, the essence of life for us. And, uh, and this is and I think this is the, the joker that we found out that no matter if you are in Canada or Switzerland or India or Brazil, All mothers uh, share the same needs, basic, very basic, before they know what their um, political values or whatever, very basic that it's common to all mothers around the world. And I think those needs are uh, consider our children and our life and the values. And once you have this, you can share the idea with many others and they can participate with you and share with you. Uh, the same feeling and the same uh, uh, influence. And in uh, Europe, they call it social movement because those mothers are, and you see in a minute how, how is the change is, I'll show you. So this is the, the, the basic. Mothers lead families, families build communities and communities generate changes. And I think that the, the Corona time show it very strongly because <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a mom and a community, what the bonding is the net and the ball, basically, because this is what we share uh, together all around, all, all mom and around the world. But in the Corona time, we didn't have the net and we didn't have the ball. And yet we stay together. We, it's like was, it like was social resilience. All mothers together, we got Zoom talking together. We got Zoom to have training together. And we check that everybody is okay around us and not around us. And we got contact with other mothers all around the world to see how they pass the Corona time, what they do. We share values, we share experience, we can see from each other. And uh, this is a, a, this sharp, The, the, the meaning and uh, as we are a community. And I think this is a very, very strong uh, value that no matter what, we are staying together and we are community and we influence other. And how we influence other, I can show you, not in, only in Corona time, but as the, part of the DNA of MamaNet. Uh, if you can see here on the right side, up right side is the third uh, age Mamanet, uh, golden age, we call it. And for the um, uh, people age of 65 and up, and they, they come to us and they say, why can't we play? Because we are 65, but yet we are very young physically and we are uh, act active and we are uh, participating, uh, participating in many uh, sports. We want also Mamanet because our, our daughter is playing and we want to. So we said, okay, it's a good point. And we started to uh, have a lot of uh, gold uh, AJ Mamanet and all the mothers players bring their mothers to play in this uh, uh, league. And this is a phenomenon because uh, you don't need flyers. You don't need to uh, market it. You know, you bring, you ask your mother to come to play and you create a, a team and a league and it's amazing. And in the left side, it's also, it's the same. Those are the, uh, our children in Mamanet. And we have kidnet tournament, kidnet for children, for our children. So with no flyers, with no nothing. Imagine that 10,000 mothers will bring only one child each. <laughs> we have 10,000 children for a tournament. We don't have enough space to do tournament because it's very heavy. And in each, in each city, we have like three, 400 uh, uh, kids playing come to play because they want to show like mothers. They want to play like mothers. So they come and we have a lot of uh, tournaments and it's amazing. 
and putting the love of words by those uh, children, uh, by playing, and the mothers are the coaches of them, and they teach them what to do and how to play, and they, they do training before the tournament. This is uh, this is the real life, you know? This is uh, the, the dream to, to do sport, to live sport. To, it's a way, like a way of life, not, not just... When I woke up in the morning, I mama net, and when I go to sleep, I mama net, not only on the court. And this is a, a strong... Uh, a belong to, belonging and strong sports statement to be players anytime and to be mama at any time. And the left side down, it's a prisoner. It's a prison, a women prison in Israel. We have only one prison. Luckily, we have only one prison in Israel. And unlike the, the men prison, that they have a court, a, a gym, a indoor gym. The women don't have indoor gym. Uh, so they have to force to uh, to play outside. So by five years now, we come to uh, um, coaches come and train them, those uh, prisoners. And it's amazing to see the influence. They are waiting for a, a Monday, four o'clock when our coaches coming and they waiting for them in the gate and want to play. And uh, those that they release from prison, and, to, and they find a new way, a new home, a new place, a new way in life, they become part of Mama Net Leagues in their city. And no one knows what was uh, their background. And they, we accept them as they are, and their children play with our children, and we don't care. And I think that the strong in community is a part of it. It's a get to not those in your close circles but get to those who are in the who are in the far circles of your life and influence them and i think that this is a, a great example and for the prison uh, they're a way to indicate if it's successful or not if a, a prison go out uh, if it's success or not is the idea that is not she is not coming back and Mamanet holds them in the community and don't let them go back to what they did and what they were and to the prison. And this is a very, very influence, influential social responsibility. Uh, uh, so for us as mothers, it's uh, we, we really do believe and we do social uh, responsibility uh, and uh, also health responsibility, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, also, we went to the United Nations uh, and we got ac accepted as a model, special model uh, for women and sport. And in the left side, this is in Austria. And what they do in Austria, they have a big problem with refugees. The Syrian refugees that come to uh, Austria, the women become very apathic and very sick and depressed and they don't go, go, go out from home, and they, they don't speak the language, and sometimes they are beaten by their husband, and not a good life. And uh, the government of um, uh, Austria uh, gathered five uh, uh, government offices, the health, welfare, um, uh, sport, women, and education, uh, offices and they get one million, uh, one and a half million euros to put in this project, Mamanet for refugees. And those refugees, uh, mothers, come with their daughters to play Mamanet and they become and they start to be engaged with the local uh, uh, women, the Austrian women. They start to uh, uh, speak the language. And what's amazing about now is that those uh, uh, refugees that uh, uh, playing Mamanet, we now, we made them a um, uh, course for um, training coaches. So they become coaches and they start to gain money and bring money home as, co as Mamanet coaches. And this is something that it's very influence um, for, uh, for the government of Austria to see how uh, it's a process, how she become from refugee to be a player to do sport and for sport you need no language you know we all come to the court and we all look the same and we play the same 
and we don't care and we are as one. So this is a very strong um, influence. And in the right uh, downside, spatial needs, uh, we have uh, teams of spatial needs. And by the way, all the all what I've said, uh, show you now, it's not that um, we say something and everybody is doing. Those uh, uh, initiative comes from the field, which means that those mother that plays Mamanet uh, feels tremendous engagement to the place that they uh, stay, to the Mamanet and to the platform of Mamanet to fulfill their dreams, their ideas, whatever they think can be good or can be uh, do something uh, for others. They share it with us and we do everything uh, to have it uh, come true. And it's amazing to see how this is how also Mamanet is spreading out to many countries and many mothers. Not that we are saying, hey, listen, we have a great idea and uh, now share it with us. No, those mothers are the best, best, best um, uh, diplomacy uh, and um, to to say what, why is Mamanet is very uh, crucial and good for them. And they share their experience, the experience in Mamanet and they spread it out. It's like a fire, you know? All of us want to be belong to something so good, so um, uh, with values and uh, to, that they share with others and contribute to the society. Uh, in many, many different ways. So this is very uh, crucial. Uh, also, we have uh, 10,000 mothers and it's like um, 800 uh, teams or more. And we needed coaches for 800 teams in Israel and out, uh, out of Israel. And we start to look around and we didn't find because uh, they are not in the basketball and in other uh, branches, we didn't find. So what we decided to do is to open the Mamanet campus. And what is so unique in the Mamanet campus? First of all, 90% of the participants are women. Usually in courses, in sport courses, 99% are men. In Mamanet, those women. And not, all, not only women, those players, those were players, Mamanet players, that imagine two years ago, they had no idea about sport. They become players and now they become coaches. And it's amazing to see the process, how they be to they start to understand the, the, the sport language, uh, read tables of uh, winning, losing, um, you know, the rates of uh, points or whatever. So it's like speaking a new language for them. And they become coaches and our children become scorers of the games and the, uh, the mature one become referees. So we, we uh, hold the whole community together with us in the court, in the sport. And this is uh, very beneficial for uh, the sport and also for uh, the, the government, you know, because those mothers and those children that are um, uh, playing and uh, sharing and uh, having sport, you know, uh, later, they save uh, money from not being in the hospitals and from not being sick because they are aware of uh, well-being and the uh, uh, food and whatever and healthy way of life. And this, for the long term, it's really influence the, the society as a whole. This is very important. And this is in Austria. Though, uh, this uh, girl, she is uh, studying the scoring of uh, the game. And her mother at the same time was in the coach uh, uh, course. So it was like a very excited uh, to see. Um, okay. Um, a minute. One of the important, I think it's the most important thing that we have in Mamanet, and I think it's, it's so uh, Olympism value. In Mamanet, the, the, um, we are not allowed to boo the mothers. You only allowed to cheer your team. We teach our children, and the children are the fans, the children, the husband, that you don't have to hate 
the other team in order to love your team. Don't spend energy for hating somebody. Spend your energy for uh, uh, cheering your uh, team. And uh, so we uh, have also, we have zero tolerance for this uh, kind of violence. It's a violence for us. We are not allowed to boo. No child allowed to boo, no mother, whatever, no matter what. You know, this is a strict rule. And the referee allows to stop the game until it's quiet. And by that, we have, usually in sport, we have the yellow card and the red card warning and then uh, punishing. And we have the yellow heart, we call it. The, sorry, the green heart, we call it. And we give it for a, a teams and the fans that uh, uh, behave nice because it's a positive reinforcement, uh, you know, um, for mothers and for fans because... Um, and it's amazing to see what the green heart is doing because we know, I know that if a, a, my a, a opponent in the other court is falling down, I help her to raise up. And if I touch the net, I admit. And uh, the fans of my team not boo her. So it gives the environment of the game a very special and unique environment. It's not only fighting and the, the tension of winning or losing. It's it's more relaxed. It's more. Um, it's it's nicer to play to play in this environment. I think it's it it contributes so much for the game, and uh, the environment is is nice to be because remember, not all of us, uh, uh, not all of the mothers, uh, are uh, you know uh, professionals, and uh, and they also have the right to feel right. At the, at the court and out of the court. So this is a very, so uh, on uh, 2017, we got, uh, we got um, from the European Fair Play Movement, the award for this uh, kind of value of a uh, fair play, not booing, not allowed to boo, and for, and for the yellow heart, the positive reinforcement for, mother, for mothers and fans. So we are very, very proud of this. Uh, um, uh, price. Um, having that said, <laughs> we are not only talking about Mamanet, but there are academic researchers that confirm what I have said until now. And this is, I think, a very strong um, uh, saying that we have numbers, not only talking. And so there were a few uh, researchers about Mamanet that uh, has been done. One of them, what is the motivation to join Mamanet in midlife? In the age of 35, 40, you're not uh, easily uh, obligated to every week to go for a, a, the training and every week for a game. And so what makes, uh, because we are mothers and we have other obligations uh, to go out and uh, do other stuff. And uh, if I have a wedding of my best friend on the game date, where do I go? Of course, the game. <laughs> so this is a kind of a, the changing set of values that I mentioned at the beginning, because this is what's really important. And this is what they feel that they obligate to. And this is part of being um, um, obligated to some to, to sport team. So it changed all the, the sets of uh, values. And <clears throat> amazingly enough, uh, when they saw the, the scores, uh, the winning or losing wasn't the first motivation uh, of joining Mamanet, but being belonged to a social team, social sportive team was the first. And usually in sport, when you check what is the motivation, it's winning or losing. And you can see that mothers are not coming only for winning or losing, but for other uh, values. And this is very, it was very important, amazing uh, for us. And the other uh, very big uh, three years uh, research about Mamanet and the influence of Mamanet on the social and health capital. And th this is also very unique because if you check a, a league, a sport league, you don't check about the social, you check about the sportive, uh, you know, uh, the sportive and health uh, well-being. But here they checked also the social um, 
influence and it was amazing to to see the results and i have the results if uh, someone is uh, interesting and to see that um, uh, you know it's absolute uh, numbers in favor of those that uh, play mamanet and they compare uh, uh, mothers that are uh, playing mamanet, mothers that do other sport but not mamanet, and mothers that do nothing, and they compare them, and not, on, not only compare them, but they compare the same women, the same player for three years, the first year, the second year, and the third year. And what did they saw that in extreme evidence, those mothers of mamanet, um, the, uh, uh, the more years she's in the mamanet, the more influence she has in the social capital and the health and the well-being. And this is amazing uh, results because it's influenced the, the future time of um, our well-being and health and social. And more. And they, they feel more that they contribute more for the society and the, the social. And the, it's very important uh, for us as uh, people to know that we are uh, uh, living in a better place. And, and we create the better place. Not We are not waiting for others to do this, but we are responsible for this and we are doing this. And this is very strong. Um, some, you know, a few awards that we got, I mentioned it before because uh, it's very uh, amazing to see how it's spread out and how others outside of Mamanet see Mamanet. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs chose Mamanet to be the in the... Uh, program uh, creative energy to show the beautiful face in of Israel not by uh, only by a technological startup and uh, whatever but so social community and the uh, female startup and this is a very unique way uh, to show your uh, country and uh, as I mentioned the UN recognized Mamanet as a mean to achieve sustainable development and promotion within the framework of uh, United Nations 2030 program uh, in India, I was in New, in New Delhi to gain the prize of Women of the Year in Community, um, Entrepreneurship innovation, Innovations, and in Israel, I gained the Women of the Year in Israeli Sport, even though I'm not a sport even, I'm not going to the Olympic, uh, and I'm not, uh, you know, the, the champion of uh, whatever. But the impact that the Mamanet is doing on the sport, it's strong enough for them to uh, recognize me as a woman of the year in sport. And the fair play spirit, as I mentioned, and the very important one is the, um, uh, the prize that we gained uh, last year. Uh, I'm aware, and I want to say a few words before I'm uh, finished. I'm aware is a tournament that we do uh, for women to go to check for a, a breast cancer, pre-check for breast cancer, because if you find it in a very early stage, you can save uh, your life, you know, you can treat it and they uh, get healthy. And uh, this uh, idea came from a few uh, mamanet players that were sick with breast, breast cancer, and they said, ask us to do something so many uh, women will uh, expose to it and will go to check. So we decided to have a big tournament and we have 24 nets in the best, best uh, uh, stadium uh, in Israel that the, uh, the municipality of Rishon Lezion uh, mayor gave us, contribute us. And thousands of mothers come with a uh, red, uh, with a pink shirt. And we say, we play on the court and not with our life. And each player that come to play in this tournament has to... Uh, we have a big, big uh, wall, and each one of them has to sign, I checked, and she marked V, and she, that she checked. And few mothers that went and they checked before they come to the tournament found that they have a breast cancer. And beca only because they went to check and they found it, found it in early stage, and they treat it, they, it saves their life. So here's an example for a health responsibility by the sport field. And this is the power of uh, mothers uh, that we influence like ripples, many, many others and in many, many fields. And uh, for this, we gain uh, among 50 countries, we got the, the diversity award for this. Uh, and also we have to, we will do another tournament for a violence against, uh, against women and uh, families and children. 
So this is uh, this is how we we convey uh, um, responsibilities and the uh, issues, strong issues of our society to others, and uh, uh, bring it to awareness of many many others around us and far from us. And this is influential. This is social movement. This is why they call it social movement. So before I finish, I will just say another uh, sentence. Uh, when I started Mamonet, I, as you remember, I said to the one that forced me to come with her, not now, not uh, always, why not, why not, why not uh, do things? And um, when I go to, when at the beginning, I went to sport departments to con con convince them to have Mamonet because at the beginning, all of them throw me out. And I convinced them why you should have Mamanet. And they start to give me thousands of excuses. Why not? Because it's very uh, not for mothers and we don't have enough courts and the children are there playing and the men are playing in the court. So we don't have time and there are no nets and no balls. And no, 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 no. <laughs> and I was listening carefully. And when they finished talking, I said to them, okay, now give me only one reason why yes. You told me 10,001, why no? Tell me why, reason why, yes, you have a mamanet in your place. And from this point, we start to talk about this. So we always, in our life also, we have excuses why not to do things. Found yourself the one yes you have, and from this, start your uh, uh, doing. And I hope that uh, in India, you will have a mamanet league, a big, a huge mamanet league that influenced the mothers, the children, and everybody else. Thank you very much. Ofra, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real influence, inspiring, and huge social impact. Uh, if I could say correctly, a perfect example of the spirit of Olympism. Hats off to you, Ofra. Thanks. Thank you very much, because uh, this is what I said at the beginning, that this is Olymp Mamanet is Olympism. Absolutely. Because the way to the court and the way from the court, this is what's important, and this is the influence that we have. I'm sure. I'm sure. And um, a way to go forward. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, I was just uh, noting down a lot of things when you were speaking, when you were showing your um, PPTs, a um, lot of curiosity that is going in my head. And I have picked up a few comments with um, from our viewers. Uh, Anubhav, can I go ahead with those? Or if you want to add something? Yes, Dr. Mukherjee. So we have about three or four minutes uh, before we kick off yes. the next presentation. So as long as Absolutely. you're mindful of that, uh, I'm totally fine with you going ahead. All right. So uh, Ofra, um, you today you validated one of my personal belief um, you know um, i have always believed that people pay, play sport we play sport uh, irrespective of our levels whether it is amateur grassroots or professional for the joy of playing that's the most important thing and you today you validated that and one in one slide you said mothers are the best coaches and uh, that's why they teach uh, so you, are, you you spoke about winning versus success. You know, like winning is good to have, but success is something which is must to have. Uh, what what is your take on you know having a larger participation in specific? Because what, what is, I'm sure when, uh, to 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 create a larger participation of human, what what is your suggestion for our country? Because I'm sure you had various challenges. You know, you had various challenges when you started this, um, and 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 any movement like this. Uh, how how do we uh, how, how have you created this larger participation impact? Uh, first of all, when I created it, there was nothing, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was much much difficult, you know, <laughs> to create from nothing something. It's much difficult now. We have it, so you can see it before. If you want to convince somebody, you can show him uh, pictures, you can show him uh, YouTube's, and you can show him how, how it's going uh, with other countries. So it's easier to convince, but uh, the 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 mamanet start from bottom down, from bottom up. Okay, it started with me. I created more and more mothers uh, attend me. And but in in your uh, position now, you can start it both ways. You can start it from up to down by saying this is a, a, a something that we want a program or a, a, 
something that we want as a country, as a sport, as a, a message, as a health, whatever, project or whatever. And this is a national uh, project that we want to apply. And by having that also find those crazy mothers like me. And there, there are so many crazy mothers like me, you can't imagine. And while you show them this idea, you know, Mama Net started to raise up, not because I went to the mayor of their city, because those two mothers sit together and they start to talk. And she said to her, well, what do you say? Coach, what? Mama Net, what is it? And oh, call Ofra, she will tell you. And when I told her what to do, I didn't go with her to her city to build it. She went to the mayor and she convinced him and they start to build it in their places. Right, you know, this right, sounds right. so it's very easy to I find crazy mothers that will initiate it and together it becomes like a fire. You don't need, you just have to light oh. the fire. The fire will start to spread it out easily. And if you want, I will come and I will show you how to do the method of, because it's a method okay. to do this. And it's so easy. And, and while you have the, the national and the government support, you can be 500 times uh, uh, much uh, from Israel, you know, than Israel, because yes, it's yes. so easy uh, when you have the, the G and it's not a lot of infrastructures, you know, it's not a soccer or whatever, rugby, it's gym. Yeah, ball, it's with very basic. The, so, and the influence, it's much, much bigger. Trust me, Ofra, we need a lot of crazy mothers like you. <laughs> you have them. You have, you have to find yes, them. We are. Have, yeah. the, the okay, last one minute, Ofra. Uh, well, uh, I, I, know, I noted down a couple of comments from Gita Sharma, Pooja, and Divya Saini, where they mentioned about correct mindset, uh, empowering a woman, and also a solution to a lot of uh, problems faced by women especially. Uh, my last question, uh, in, in very specific, where do you see men um, supporting or challenges? Um, is there at all any involvement of men? I'm sure you have, but is there? Is it? Is it also partially they are involved, or is all women driven by men? No, no, no. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's feminism, but without being feminist, you know, <laughs> because because. We, we do we do for sport and uh, it's a, a women empowerment because we have a, a players that from being players and build mamanet in their places they become a, a municipality members and the head of municipality and they holding the sport uh, in their uh, city so they become in a position you know because it's a uh, it drives them but it's not only for uh, women it's for men and they be, can be coaches and if you're in your heart with the Olympism and the values of Mamanet, you're in. And there are many, many men that feel the same and want to be part of Mamanet and bring them together and bring children to this and be coaches. And we have many things that they can be together with us. We don't care whom love Mamanet is in. Thank you so, so much, Ofra. Um, I'm sure today's inspiration you would see in the coming days to come from us as well. And uh, we will have a lot of crazy mothers and we will also be a part of this uh, wonderful initiative. Uh, it was a real privilege and a pleasure to having you and speaking with you, Ofra. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. Shalom. 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 Over to you, Anubhav. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mukherjee. That was uh, beautiful, and thank you so much, uh, Ofra, ma'am. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. As uh, Dr. Mukherjee said, you know the the comments that came pouring in on our on our platforms uh, were extremely heartwarming. So many people seem to have been uh, affected in a very positive manner based on uh, your presentation, and uh, this was very empowering for everyone, especially for for mothers, daughters, uh, women uh, who are watching from all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely. Great. Uh, so we're all set uh, to uh, start the next session. Uh, and uh, the next session that we have on the cards will be moderated by Dr. Kiran Sandhu. And she's uh, an MD or Managing Director at Elevate Training Australia and trainer and assessor of uh, vocational workplace skills courses in uh, Australia. Dr. Sandhu, are you with us? Yes, uh, lovely, Dr. Sandhu. I see you now. I'll just add you to the stream. Uh, lovely. So I'm guessing, uh, are you based in Australia? If so, then I should be wishing you a good evening right now. Yes, it is good afternoon, 4.30. <laughs> good afternoon. Which part of Australia are you in? I'm in Sydney. 
you're in Sydney. Lovely. How many years have you spent in Sydney now? Uh, for how long have you been in um, Sydney? In Sydney, it's been more than three years, but I've been in Western Australia for very long. And before that, I was in Delhi based with Delhi University. You must have seen it through a profile. I've sent you a little bit small little thing. Absolutely. I worked for Delhi University and College of Sports Sciences and Department of Physical Education. A lot of involvement. Feeling very pleased to be with you all. Thank you. Lovely, and and we're we're even more pleased to have you on our networks. Uh, you know, you've been uh, you've been all over the place. You uh, truly goes to show that you're a a global citizen. I will now let you have the stage, and you can uh, establish what the topic is that will be discussed over the next fifty minutes or so, as well as introduce uh, the speaker that we have uh, for this very special session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Hello, everybody. All my listeners and viewers. You're welcome on this seminar. I must have to say bravo to the organizing committee to begin with, and then I have to extend a warm welcome to you all. My very, very special welcome to Ada, our today's presenter, Ada Jaffrey. Friends, I have this honor. She's one name which is associated with Olympism and education movement in Pakistan. My friends, we, we all welcome Ada on this web webinar. On an opening note, I like to be a little lighter, easy, and realistic in life. Ada, her name, has Arabic origin, which means grace and expression. In Hindi, her name denotes noble, kind, happy, brightness, prosperous, and style. I don't think she's shot off anything out of when I met her, when I spoke to her. I've had a few chats with her. I really believe, and from her activities in Pakistan, she has gracefully conducted and involved herself in this, true to her name. Ada is professionally a consultant for education, sport, and Olympism. She brings a lot of experience and passion of working in a developing society. She has been a consultant with Government of Punjab, Pakistan Olympic Association, Member Education Olympic Council of Asia, Project Coordinator, Pakistan Olympic Association, Pakistan Karate Federation, Member Olympic Culture and Heritage Commission of National Olympic Committee, Pakistan. She is member of Executive Council, Pakistan US Alumni Network. She is the first Mimosian International Olympic Committee, and she is the administrator at Lahore Grammar School. Alongside all this big list of engagements, Ada is a staunch advocate of women empowerment and strongly believes in empowerment through education initiatives. Apart from it, she is a social worker, a mentor, an expert on Olympic studies in Pakistan. Ada Jaffi today will be presenting Olympism and digital technology. But friends, I will take you through her life journey alongside Olympism right in an interactive mode it won't be that we let her only speak we want to ask her many things how what why how did she manage to do all these things beautiful things of olympism and created that spirit in her country and i will now put it over to ada i won't really come in between ada jaffrey for all of you over to ada uh, hello everyone Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Audible. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Audible. All right. That in Pakistan. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. And a big hello from uh, Pakistan. And thank you so much, Kiranji. Uh, I mean, the way you have explained, I feel proud about myself that I've done quite a lot. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Neeraj, who is always there. And uh, thank you, Neeraj, who is always there pushing me every hour and every second of the day. Where are you? Where is your presentation? Are you ready? Is your internet connection stable? And thank you, StreamYard team, uh, for such a tremendous job. This whole online thing is too difficult for me, but you guys have made life pretty easy. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. And, and I warmly welcome all the listeners, all those who are watching from India and outside India globally, the global viewers. So we will begin uh, with the difficult 
part, which is sharing the screen and getting things, things done and showing you my presentation. Uh, and uh, once I have the slides here, and then I'll start explaining uh, what we're going to talk about today in this session. I've been so scared since yesterday because when I see oh, oh, the presentation is not working, video is not working. <laughs> okay, and now so can you show the PDF, guys? In case you have the PDF, see my start, scroll through the PDF slides. No, no, no. So can, is, can you see, is, see the screen, by the way? Yes. Yes, ma'am. We I can, can see it. Uh, I'm presentation mode as well? Yes, ma'am. If, yeah, if you could just uh, change it to presentation mode, then we'll be able to see it better. But we can still see what you have on your screen. Brilliant, ma'am. So no hiccups, nothing at all. So the, the thing that you were afraid yeah, of uh, has been extinguished. It, I mean, go on, ma'am. OK. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Going to the first okay, slide. God. So, yes. So we, uh, yes. So the for uh, integrating and into digital learning, right? And, and the word, word digital comes from the. Current pandemic and changed in the uh, about learning modules that are going on everywhere in every country. And apart from it, I will talk about the evolving role of institutions. So, the, the UN level, and then how the National Olympic Committees, NGOs, and different uh, people and volunteers running different community initiatives can play their role in this whole scenario of Olympism, Olympic education, and digital learning. Right. So, um, first thing, just simply, just a reminder, as a lot of uh, thousands of fans of Olympism uh, are sitting across the screens. We just a quick reminder that all of philosophy of a better world and Olympism is indeed all about, uh, you know, excellence, respect and friendship and the global values, uh, the global values and the working principles of the Olympic movement. Uh, when we talk about service of humankind, how can we forget an organization like United Nations that has been working for years and years for the betterment of the world? And uh, it's such a great honor for people who are associated with Olympism uh, at any level that Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, sa said uh, that Olympic principles are actually the United Nations principles. So this one statement, you know, um, brings the uh, put the olympism and the un movement in one plate together the five uh, i'm sure most of you are av uh, already aware about the un sustainable development goals so the, these were launched back in 2015 these are seven goals uh, that you know goals that you can see on are the ones that are exactly in alliance with the philosophy of Olympism so if you are a co being or with the social change happening in the world or with the spirit of Olympism 
be rest assured that you are uh, co contributing in projecting these five SDGs, right? So again, going back to that as an athlete or as a sports manager, all of you, even if you don't consider yourself uh, an on the field Olympic champion, I strongly believe that all of you are the non sporting Olympic champions. So, uh, you know, hats off to all of you and this great community around me uh, who are, uh, you know, contributing somehow or the other for the promotion of uh, well being of humankind and Olympism. And one of them is sitting, you know, across the screen, my own moderator, Ms. Kiran, who and has Dada, been it could be a athlete who has yes. been a Thank you, Ada. I yeah. also have something to ask you at this point of your presentation. I have a very, um, I've really been impacted the way you have been doing from young age. I think my friends, my viewers and listeners must have to know that Ada has been very active since her younger days. Her first initiative at the young age of 16 years was to having a setup, an afternoon school under the umbrella of Road Association. Another one, at the age of 20, she organized All Pakistan NGO Festival 2009, and then Junood, a teenage talent hunt. It was organized by her when she herself was just 21. She has also led a team of 200 students of India and Pakistan for a two-year exchange for change program. This was primarily to minimize cultural misconceptions and integration conflict. I really, I really wonder what, I mean, you are respecting the sports people, you are asking the athletes, you are asking successful Olympians, you are asking successful competitors. But I have to ask you, what made you, how help you do so much at such a young age to promote Olympic Olympism values, excellence, respect, friendship, all the most out of all your initiatives? Could you please brief us before you go further with your presentation? Ada. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karen. I'm really humbled and honored. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, frankly, I, I so it's, it basically came from home. Uh, my mother has always been a social worker. So she was the one when we were young. So she, we saw her, you know, giving stretching training and basic literacy training to all the Going uh, uh, from, from the beginning that no. no I have to raise indeed the law that see. It was a uh, initiative in which we had we exchanged letters at the end of the program. Uh, the enabling environment, you know, has helped me. And after the after serving grammar school for a decade, when I started working with the sports organization. With the national federations, that isn't for me that opening so much more to achieve. So now, from doing things for girls, I wanted to do things for the 
national champions hold on hold on uh, Ada, you need to explain the environment to us. of my 1000 school <laughs> yes ada time out for me i am on the floor for you you need to explain us okay i read sure. to your resume that you claim that you come from a conservative family you come from a family which initially you felt you were not able to do as much as you thought to be yeah. however i oh. just go through when i'm listening to you that you done your school programs you done women program you play you've been selected for us state department in pakistan for international visitors leadership program you have also uh, done that uh, as you said um, international olympic committee solidarity program and you traveled so much would you kindly tell us how this olympism help you how your family friends your teachers your mentors and others all those social institutions in your personal life how did they help you promote that olympism or olympism brought those they they brought those uh, social institutions in your life how it worked you have to really ex- tell us and tell tell my viewers that how these two things were kind of interacting olympism and the social institutions in your personal life of course in the formal structures which you're going to talk also over to you ada i oh, it's your your flo- floor is for you ada ma'am can you hear mrs sandhu clearly no i can't hear her me me neither Adam ma'am can you hear us sir ma'am i think uh, there might be some issue with uh, the internet uh, that you have so the reputation of the internet in pakistan is at stake ma'am uh, can you hear us i'm just kidding ma'am can you hear us uh, so you you seem to be yes, frozen i can i can uh, hear yes. you clearly and, but i'm not sure if uh, and mm, she has to kind of explain or give us some evidences how her social institutions supported the olympism and how olympism supported her enthusiasm for olympism this is yes. a very interesting dialect which we would like to listen from her and she has to present her social institutions uh, slides also and it she's really prepared a very beautiful presentation i hope she comes on the floor now hoping the same too so i'll just add her again to the front stage uh, hoping uh, we're second time lucky Yes ma'am. Ada ma'am, I think I I think you can hear us now, right? We can see you clearly. We can see movement at your end as well. So you're on mute right now. If you could just unmute yourself and then uh you could uh continue from where you left off. Yes ada. Uh hi. Sorry, question. I had some uh technical issue. I think I I lost you guys and now that I'm back Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I repeat ma'am. my question. My question to you was How did social institutions Wi-Fi help you go for olympism and how olympism helped the social institutions come in your life? They played and they really impacted you and really kind of it is both ways how the bipolar process how it happened. If you could please give us you can play your slides for social institutions role can you you have a video oh gosh can we say sorry to my viewers for technical problems believe <laughs> believe, believe it's the same issue uh, so adam ma'am has dropped right now i'm hoping she can uh, enter the broadcast studio again in no time and uh, let's see if uh, you know with her time lucky we we definitely apologize to all of viewers uh, who are watching us right now so adam ma'am has joined us again and hopefully third time is the charm hi hi can you hear Hello, me ma'am. now guys yes ma'am yes. we can we can hear you ma'am Sorry, we can see you as well I... sorry sorry for uh, this whole uh, thing i think there was some ten issue with the technical issue and i uh, lost the connection 
And now okay. I am just back with the slides here. Yeah. Now the slides are visible. It's taking time, but it Can will you be. And you are ready with your uh, video? Are you ready with your video? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 the videos are ready. All right. Uh, so my question is lost uh, in your presentation. Sorry for losing the connection. No problem. I am so sorry. I think I overheard half of it. Half of it. If you could just quickly summarize it, and I'll. I in would summary, love to in one liner, I like you to kindly give us some evidence, some explanation, some understanding, some insight of yours. How social institutions, your family, friends, teachers, mentors, and others played role in your life to promote Olympism and how Olympism brought that spirit in you to take to get along with all these family you know, family friends teachers and mentors mm -hmm. how these two things work together yeah so so uh, as you mentioned earlier that i've also you know i proudly say that uh, when i was growing up i belong from a sayyid family and you know in uh, muslim cultures and sayyid families generally it's a little bit hard for girls to go for jobs and i mean in my family we are the first generation of women who are actually working in the field because before that my mom my aunts nobody was allowed to work so in this whole scenario i think my father played the role of a champion because from a very early age he said that like you know when i was in grade three or grade five he was used to tell us that you can even marry any boy whoever you like right so uh, he has uh, he has played a great role uh, you know in pushing us uh, and you know achieving more and more every day uh, so that's uh, where you know i was able to despite being from a family which was not very uh, women empowerment ideals oriented i was able to you know uh, achieve start achieving at a younger age uh, and of course and we are for yeah mm -hmm. and then and then uh, so after working with the school for a decade i still had that void that i want to enhance my outreach i am if i can impact 1000 students why can't i impact 1000 people or oh, 1 uh, 100000 people so this enhancement of outreach of impacting people for a social change is something that you know eventually uh, took me to the people who were associated with olympism in the country and luckily the national olympic committee pakistan the leadership they were so supportive, uh, so positive that they opened the door for me uh, like anything. And I initiated my engagement by working with the Karate Federation and then the Olympic uh, um, organization. And then I got to know that there is something called Olympic education. I got to know there is something called Olympic culture and heritage. And from there, it never ended. <laughs> the journey went on and Good. on. And and the ideas of Olympism and uh, why I was able to do so much was the, the global values of excellence, friendship and uh, respect, respect that with these, with these great, you know, and inspiring values. How is it possible that someone who is associated with the brand at a local level or at an international level cannot work more? And then the icing, uh, the, you know, topping icing on the cake was that I was enrolled for MEMOS, which is the most prestigious program of the International Olympic Committee. And uh, I uh, traveled across Europe and US uh, for a year while I was doing that course. And that again was, uh, you know, a completely changing scenario for me because I started meeting people like I met Neeraj, I met Vita, I met so many uh, Olympic ambassadors from across the so globe. The friendship, and, friendship was promoted with yeah. Olympism students. Yeah, so the right. friendship is friendship still. I mean, still on WhatsApp every day, each and every day we talk, you know, from Switzerland, Good. Namibia. Ada, we would like everything. to have your video also on board. Yeah. If you are yes. ready with your video. So, yeah, so the next, uh, uh, so I'll just cover this slide quickly because in the title, as I explained, that I want to talk about how uh, the evolving role institutions can play in further, you know, delivering the spirit of Olympism uh, across the globe. These institutions, I a lot of people think that if you are working for a National Olympic Committee and if you are working for a National Sports Federation, only then you have the ability to, um, you know, play your role in promoting Olympism and in promoting the Olympic ideals across the globe. But I believe even if you're working in a school, you're working in any NGO, you're working for any community initiative.
you can still uh, you can still play uh, you know a uh, role uh, and and i believe that as the we see that over the years over the decades how the olympic movement has evolved and how the latest agenda of the olympic movement is so holistic and it covers almost everything from athletes in tourage to the journalists to the gender equality to sports to culture so i i strongly believe that in the same way in the way how olympic movement has evolved over the years in the same way all these institutions locally also needs to be evolved so they should be working in collaboration totally agreed. and uh, agreed. in partnership with each other for the promotion of olympics yeah yes. so now i would just to show you that how beautifully a uh, different okay great and in fact doc uh, keran i would like you to comment on this because you have seen the olympic movement ev evolving when you were an athlete and then you became a trainer a coach a mentor and now we see you here uh, you know as anubhav mentioned being a global ambassador how have you seen the olympic movement you know evolving over the years i personally feel very strongly about sporting activities sport has never been very competitive um attractive to me although i played for asian competition sports asian level competitions however whatever i am today it's because of my my sporting activities my social affiliation with sporting people i just learned the biggest lesson of life which olympism taught me was you play every day you lose but you play again next day you never give up i think that was the biggest lesson i ever got from that spirit of excellence carry on try on carry on try on and i admire you for doing your best and well i did my best i've had great um, i'm still very very active in my circles through my elevate training australia programs in which we involve youth leadership programs and activities however it's your day today please go mm. on with your uh, video yeah And yeah. So with uh, so with uh, so with this, uh, as doctor, uh, as, I don't know why I feel that you are a doctor. <laughs> so I am a doctor. Kiran yes. Has, oh, so as doctor Kiran has just mentioned, um, I believe that with the uh, you know if, with the way how Olympic movement has evolved and the way now we see that we don't talk about only sports when we talk about Olympic movement. We go beyond sports and we talk about education, we talk about culture, we talk about heritage, we talk about sensitive issues like gender equality. And then with all this seriousness, we do have the element of fun and entertainment uh, uh, attached to the Olympic movement. I will just share with you a video now, which is, uh, uh, I consider it a small achievement. uh we are it is about our olympic day of the pakistani community that we had in 2019 and uh, we tried to integrate uh, sports education and culture together in this event and i think uh, so it was all about arts it was about sports it was about uh, education and awareness and this festivity of you know the olympic movement so i'm just playing the video enjoy it's a 2 minutes video बड़ा कर दो इज इट नो वर्किंग चल रहा यस वी कैन वॉच इट वेरी ब्यूटिफुल
Uh, hello. That is beautiful, Ada. You please continue with your presentation. Continue. I will ask later questions. Please continue. Okay. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So this 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 Olympic Day was all about integrating culture, education, and uh, sports, and bringing all these three beautiful elements of the Olympic uh, philosophy together. And now I would uh, now from here on I will uh, you know I'll, uh, focus a little bit more on the Olympic education. All of us know that what Olympic education is all about. It talks about uh, educating and promoting and delivering the Olympic ideals. Um, it you know it is delivered in thousand different ways in different countries as vita was speaking quite intensively about the olympic value education program uh, yesterday in the last session uh, she is of course you know an expert uh, in delivering owap in lithuania and apart from owap there are many other uh, uh, manuals and many other curriculum content booklets that help you to deliver Olympic education in, in your local community. Uh, Olympic education also, what we need to understand is not less than the legacy of the Olympic philosophy, because this is the only education tool through which we can deliver the Olympic ideals from, uh, from one, uh, let's say, one generation to the other generation, right? So this is the best way to deliver the Olympic ideas. Then as you know, the, the title of the webinar and the theme of the webinar is also about the 21st century skills and how we see Olympism in the 21st century. So I'll just have a small slide here, which talks about the 21st century skills. They are about collaboration, communication. So they basically focus on learning skills, the literacy skills, and the life skills. And exactly this is how the Olympic values framework is also also made and developed. So if you just go to the olympic.org and download OWEP 2.0 kit, it gives you a whole you know, framework with planned and ready to use activities. This is more uh, you know, for those, uh, if there are physical educators watching me over here, or if there are trainers and mentors who deliver workshops and seminars, you can very easily you know, um, bring the Olympic education uh, activities and the 21st century uh, delivering activities together and combine these activities and deliver them within the classroom or outside uh, the classroom environment right um apart from it in the next i'll also share you with with you here this that because of this global pandemic COVID 19 situation most of us have you know now become used to the online learning methodology there are many parts i'm sure in india and at least in pakistan we do have their teachers availability of laptops availability of a proper internet in the remote areas yeah so uh hello i'm still yes, there you're on screen okay go okay. on yes yeah. so so i mean in this uh pandemic situation what i think that this is a very nice time for those athletes who are in the career transition uh, you know phase of their life for those educators who generally don't get enough time to explore interesting opportunities so this is high time that all of us those who are associated with the olympic movement make the olympic education a strategic priority in the education streams so i've seen so many schools and so many colleges delivering lessons only on the main core subjects that is math science english 
and you know stuff like that because of course they have less uh, uh online in on in online education the school hours have been squeezed but i really want to emphasize here that if you are in a position as an administrator as an education leader or as a trainer your strategic priority even in these difficult times because if we can deliver the difficult uh, concepts of science and math sitting online in front of the screen out the uh, essence of olympism and the importance of physical education uh, in this time so on this next slide i'm just sharing with you a couple of different digital resources these are all free of cost Most Anubha, can Physical I education think we need, framework yes. of UNESCO. Yeah, so on this slide, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six different resources. These are all digital booklets and they are available online. The core, key websites to access these uh, resources are Sports and Development, the online library of Commonwealth Secretariat, and um, uh, uh, the Olympic.org, and then the uh, U uh, United Nations UNESCO chapter. So the, I have read most of these toolkits and I've been uh, proposing this to different physical education teachers and even teachers of other subjects because there are many activities that talks about sports and then parallel they talk about ethics. Activities that talk about sports and then they talk about, let's say, human behavior or uh, psychology and counseling and all these things. So in these digital times when people are really looking for resources online, from where they can find ready to use material. I know that for teachers, it's really difficult uh, with their busy schedules to uh, you know, completely come up with new ideas. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, just go to these websites uh, and you can access these online toolkits. There is one very interesting uh, toolkit available on international safeguards for children in sport. And this has been translated in almost 17 languages, I believe. And I think Hindi uh, is also one of the language in which this has been uh, uh, you know translated so if you are planning sessions workshops trainings online i am sure that these digital resources will be very very helpful uh, for you and when you are studying these just keep in mind the olympic ideas or uh, keep the ovep 2.0 toolkit in your mind and you can always you know mix and match uh, these resources to come up with something interesting uh, so this is uh -huh. all I want uh -huh. to talk about. And you know, yes. over in our discussion, one thing that I really want to emphasize on, and one thing that is the common factor when we talk about the UN sustainable goals, when we talk about 21st century skills, when we talk about the Olympic ideas, Olympic education, the common factor is sports. And this is one quote uh, shared, shared by Thomas Bash. Just a second. Am I audible, Kiran? Yes, yes, you go on. Please carry on. Doing very well. Am I still audible? Yes. Yes, I can. Anubhav, I think she's audible. Very clear. She is. She is. She is. I think she jinxed it by asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friends. Uh, as long as um, Anubhav is um, trying to get her back on our screens, I would like to share with you that on the front of education, Ada has done a lot of little, little efforts in her own sphere in her country, such as uh, she has um, started a Olympic library corner. That is in the schools. She has made it a uh, uh, Olympic uh, library corner is part of the main library where children go and go to others for other subjects. But they have access to the Olympism and Olympic books also. And it's named as Olympic library corner in her initiatives. It's one of the famous initiatives she's taken up. And she's also translated sports administration manual, Olympic solidarity in Urdu. She has headed that project and uh, she was able to bring this to many people and many institutions and this has been distributed all over the place so that people can connect and understand the the core values and the essence of Olympism in their own languages. They don't have to really translate and it comes ready as a reference. As she has mentioned, there are a lot of digital devices. We will request her to send us the link for all those and I will request the organizers to put those links in her uh, video later when they release the formal in 
presentation. Please ask her to give us the links for those uh, digital resources so that my viewers and listeners can use them in uh, their thing. She's also prepared a Punjab school sports strategy, PS3 it is known as. So she's done a lot of work in education through sporting initiatives and by connecting herself to education uh, um, in, um, in general life and in sporting and education circles. I hope she's back uh, to take you further. She has a beautiful video to show you uh, on the power of sports, which is going to be really, really good. Let's have a look if she's back. Can we she have her back, back on the Ma'am, she isn't back as yet, uh, but we still have about 12 minutes left uh, in uh, We this have session. a lot of work to do and we have a lot of things to really share with <laughs> Absolutely. viewers. It's only Absolutely. a question of getting her back now. I'm happy to uh, kind of share her achievements, her work, which she's doing. She has been, um, um, she's really a person who has connected herself with youth in Pakistan. And she's done a lot of Olympism movement in uh, youth um, in the Pakistan youth and she's created Olympic education through engagement and she's created an ambassador movement, which she I, she's prepared to talk about, but she has to really give us the first hand story. She's the one to really bring it us to us. She has also had a, a outreach program that is known as promotion of heritage education. So she has a lot of things like music, heritage, culture, ambassadors, youth ambassadors, how they all uh, put together in a global box of um, Olympism, how they how they really do wonders in her little world. And um, I'm feeling sorry about it if she is can't be brought back. Let's see. Let's she, give another she go. Might, she might crossed. be back now. So I do see her in the backstage. She might be back. Uh, as you said, fingers Let's, crossed. I'll add it to okay. the front stage as soon as her video is uh, Video can be seen. I think a video can be seen. Thank you. Can, can, I can't can hear that. I can bring her up. Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh. We can we can hear you. We okay. can see you. All right. Good one. So Welcome just... back. Thank you. <laughs> this is the third time, I guess. <laughs> All right. So one okay. uh, to, to, to uh, just to summarize my whole conversation before I play another interesting video and uh, share one thing which is solely based on collaboration and partnership. Uh, this, uh, think, this, this uh, there is a quote by Thomas Pash which says sports is not just a physical activity it promotes health and help prevent or even cure the disease of modern civilization it also is an educational tool which foster cognitive development teaches social behavior behavior and help to integrate community now this integrate community is something we have been talking about and uh, that's uh, uh, it from my side how much time I'm left with you have about 10 minutes Oh, great, great. Yeah, so uh, then we are good with time. So Dr. Kinner, would you like to comment on integrating community because you have lived here in the in India and now you know you are there in Australia from so many years and you have been part of the Olympic movement. So what how do you comment on integrating community? You know, now I think in digital world, there is no borders. There's no nationalities. This is only communities. And we all connect to each other so well. Like I never known you, but it looks as if I'd known you for years. <laughs> that's as of so today, I, I would, yes, that's a fact. I never met Anupam, but to me, it looks he's been a friend forever. So, like to me, connecting communities, especially through these initiatives like sporting, socialization, uh, promoting life values, promoting uh, culture, exchanging, like in our elevate training Australia programs. We bring students from India to give them a kind of a flavor of Australian life. And we from in Australia students go to India to have a flavor of Indian life. So this is the way they have been really, it's like Columbism spirit. In, in that spirit, we work all together. So integration of communities is, I think, to me, is essence, connect in soul, connect in values, and connect in life. That's yeah, what it is. I, uh, what I just want to add is that there is one recent initiative of the uh, Olympic Associ uh, International Olympic Committee, which is the um, organization for, uh, it's called the Foundation of Culture and Education. And they have selected uh, certain champions from every country to represent uh, this great forum. And this foundation of culture and education talks all about the culture and heritage elements of different countries and how uh, beautifully these uh, elements like music, arts, performing arts, and how you know these elements can uh, 
uh, put together to celebrate diversity and at the same time uh, making all these things you know inclusive and you know yep celebrating diversity calls for it i'm the one who's i think most favorite singer i have is sanam marvi from pakistan oh, and i don't nice. let a week go by when i don't listen to her she says a soul touching voice and such an impressive so this is how communities are like you know like shrink they are really yeah. integrated by their own efforts so music in sport music in we can involve engage such people who are really who can bring the forums together and bring yeah. communities together in these olympic and, forums and, and, and give it to you yes and you see would you like and, to share of some of your own experiences of yeah, yeah, heritage so, education so, programs so yes, i have young leadership have, program yeah so i have grown up you know watching all the great indian movies and you know without shahrukh khan i think there are not two days that we have not seen uh, a movie of the indian stars so music and movies and culture is indeed something that really you know connects us very well but in terms of olympics and like here in uh, pakistan and many other countries we do have the olympic museums and the heritage museums and these museums are there just to celebrate the the glorious times of all uh, the people who are associated with this uh, great movement of uh, of sports which is the olympic movement uh, i'm sure that uh, you know uh, such museums uh, should be there in every country and now that ioc is also extending a lot of support uh, for developing these museums and when we talk about you know uh, integration we talk about communities we talk about common elements on culture and heritage this is all that you know is gathered uh, is gathered uh, and you know helps in promoting peace and one such initiative of the you know international sporting bodies is the peace and sport organization and they celebrate one day which is called the idstp international day uh, of peace for the Great. development of sport and for the past 3 years uh, from pakistan we have been participating in this global campaign and it's all about you know raising a white card and showing solidarity with peace so i am just going to show you a video and with that uh, a closing remarks and we end the conversation i'm sharing this video because uh, this is one best example of collaboration of the olympic bodies and the government bodies so we uh, pakistan olympic association collaborated with uh, our provincial government and we were able to uh, have this campaign done by almost 10000 people and you will see in the video that it was uh, such a uh, you know we start the video before we short for time yeah okay. start the video okay. we may Let's not fall see. short of time
Hello. Yes. Yeah. So, so this was all sport. about. Yes. Yeah. So this video was all. This video was indeed all about power of sports because that's. Uh, uh, because of this initiative that we planned in one of our provincial games, Pakistan was nominated for a peace award in the Peace and Sport uh, Monaco. And in 2019, December, I went to attend uh, the Peace and uh, Sports Award ceremony. And it was a huge achievement. But why I'm sharing it here is that this was a true example of collaboration and partnership between the Olympic organizations and volunteers, community-led organizations, and the government itself. This was the reason that we were able to, uh, you know, take it to such a huge scale and then present it to the Peace and Sport. And um, uh, we were nominated for the award in April 6 category. Uh, and there were six countries. Uh, and interestingly, uh, I remember that I met a very nice Indian friend also there. She was from uh, an organization probably called Nandi Foundation. Uh, she was also, you know, representing India on, uh, on some other category in the award ceremony. So why I'm sharing this is that this is what the power of sports is. And this is what Olympism and Olympic ideals, uh, you know, teaches us that we should always uh, work in collaboration, in partnership uh, with, uh, with our partners within the Olympic family and even outside the Olympic family. Because if we will bring people from outside the Olympic family uh, to join our ventures and to join the movement, only then we'll be able to project uh, the Olympism and the spirit of Olympism to a wider audience. So this is where I want to end. And that's the last slide, which says that I would like you to explore when, the <laughs> You Olympic can't be abandoned. ending on it. For okay. you, this is an ongoing journey. You can't be ending here only. It's an ongoing journey. You have just started. Life is very long. And we look forward that we'll be contributing many more initiatives. However, when you were off the floor, when you were technical issues and you couldn't be on the mic, I was telling my audience about your initiatives of library corners and uh, youth leadership programs with University of Oxford and uh, uh, IDSDP, all those initiatives I referred to. I like to ask you one small question before you say that I'm ending. That is, okay. how do you look at role of youth ambassadors in the Olympism? If you could give your personal views and professional outlook towards it, what can be initiatives? What kind of initiatives we can check in there? Yeah, so frankly, I mean, uh, it's such a great question. And Olympic movement is nothing without youth. Because Olympic movement and Olympism is all about energy. And energy, I mean, with due respect to the diversity, and we do cater children and, you know, the old age group and everybody in this movement. But the energy comes from the youth. And uh, this is what I was actually coming on my life, last slide, that if you are young and energetic and passionate about sports, passionate about culture, passionate about heritage, passionate about education, then Olympic uh, floor is the light, right floor for you. It's just that you have to dig down and see the channels and what kind of people in your country are working for the promotion of Olympism. Uh, so if if you are passionate, there are many online platforms. Like there is uh, this uh, uh, .com which is called uh, Athlete Learning Gateway. I'll also post it in the comment box. So if you go to Athlete Learning Gateway, there are many, many, many free courses offered by the International Olympic Committee. And you know, generally, the courses are three hours long, five hours long. So initially, I think for youth, if they want to get connected to Olympism, the first thing is to develop that understanding of what Olympism is and what the Olympic ideals actually talk about. So once you know that, and for developing this understanding and having the knowledge bank, I think you should go to these online free of course platforms, like Athlete Learning Gateway, sign up for some courses, how to manage the social media if you are an Olympic ambassador the how to you know manage sports medicine how to manage injuries they have done this tremendous job that they have off their they offer all these courses online and the most charming part is that once you have completed that course you get a certificate signed by the president of the ioc right away within few minutes <laughs> so isn't it great <laughs> so, that's I the mean, power uh, of the sports and power of yeah, digital technology <laughs> exactly so if you want to be associated uh, with even if you're not an athlete and you don't play a sport like me I have never been a player, but even then, this whole spirit of Olympism excites me so much. So to end with it, if you have explored the Olympic ambassador within yourself or in your community, 
simply go to google connect to me connect to people like kiran neeraj and all other uh, speakers you have been listening for the uh, you know yesterday and even today and celebrate and cherish olympism thank you ada T- today you really made a sense although i really wanted to talk to you about women in empowerment but i think i'm not no, sure no, how much time neeraj can grant us we- We, uh, we otherwise, we would have really taken your discussion on to women and empowerment through Olympism. Uh, Neeraj, how, uh, sorry, uh, Anupam, how much time we have? Ma'am, we have we have plenty of time, ma'am. This is wow. this is certainly a fascinating okay. discussion. So please right. carry on. Thank you very much. We think much. so many comments coming in, and we definitely don't want to disappoint viewers by ending this uh, prematurely. So, ma'am, please go on. All right. So okay. So on women and empowerment. Uh, the, my next question. Yes. Yes. I really want to. I don't want to. L- uh have a discussion with you on uh, women empowerment in perspective of a theoretical concept no 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 just give me one or two or few experiences of yours how did you work in the developing society in that society where you claim that you came from your personal experiences of empowerment we have listened to but how did you translate that empowerment experience to other women in your life were yeah. you able okay. to if you have please share with us some experiences we'll be very delighted thank you yeah so uh, you know i started my first professional job working in a girls school as i mentioned earlier i had 1000 students at my disposal all girls and it was located in a community which was very mixed so i had students from the elite a background i had student of the salaried class and you know a very nice diverse and i think that's where diversity hit, uh, hit me so hard that it is now you know i consider it as a as part of my soul so uh, there what i uh, what i i think we all as women and as young women leaders what we need to do uh, for the promotion of women empowerment is just play our role wherever we are in the scenario in an organization in any ngo any community initiative we should keep playing our role and try uh, you know delivering these leadership qualities to the younger generation so back in i think 2014 um i developed i was working with a karate coach and i developed a team and took five girls to play a tournament to iran and luckily we came back with five bronze medals it was a total i mean uh, such a huge uh, achievement for us and for those the parents of those five girls that till today i think three of them are still playing karate and they still take self defense classes so these small things are from where you know women empowerment comes in then i think when we teach we should bring in discussions on gender equality we should bring in discussions on feminisms the wave of feminism theoretically and then arranging uh, you know certain uh, let's say um, sessions and certain conferences and workshops where we give the younger ones a chance to come up and speak simple so uh, like uh, i've been to i've been uh, as you also mentioned that i have i'm associated with pakistan us alumni network and i am uh, on the executive uh, i i'm an executive member there as well so we have a lot of yes. girls from different socio economic background there so we keep on arranging you know uh, such uh, uh, sort of forums discussions webinars and uh, trips especially plantation drives so it's just that i think so the spirit of bringing social change and then the spirit of changing the role of women and bringing in it out of that box of stereotypical thinking that oh if you are a woman you know you are not supposed i have been i have taken my girls to hiking to ice skiing to boatmanship and you know and then one thing which i did a few years back was that i started uh, i hired a proper counselor and i started counseling uh, the girls because you know when they are growing up they go through a lot of Uh, difficulties and many of them are unable to share it with their families uh, because you know of certain challenges single parents or the family is too conservative so uh, i hired a counselor and uh, this was the first time that in my school which is one of the elite schools the counselor was hired so once i was done with all of these little initiatives while working in school and i moved on to the olympic association and they saw that feministic uh, soul in me they made me the deputy um, secretary for women and sports commission of the pakistan olympic association <laughs> and yes. uh, o- over there what I, the first thing what i did because i was hearing a lot of cases on harassment in sports uh, you know harassment in the um, 
uh, of different kind so now a uh, gladly international olympic committee has given a whole toolkit of harassment and abuse and how sports organizations can tackle harassment and abuse i can also share a link of that toolkit it is also free of course i love free things actually you know so yeah i, I would request go you and explore, yes um, that on that point i'll really request yeah, so you, I will if you could kindly share all the links for digital resources because uh, many of our teachers yeah, so coaches mentors and olympic leaders olympism ambassadors they would like to may use that so if you could kindly put that to yeah, the so organizers or in okay, your um, wrap yeah. up uh, that'll be great idea so everybody can access or they can contact I people definitely. um yeah, so, from you talking so, on uh, okay, so. one question from my end uh that is that you were okay. saying that you you taken girls to hiking and skiing and very modern games and very games of uh, which so called so called elite and high mm, class, middle class above middle class people how do you relate lumpism to the traditional concept of pakistani sports traditional sports in pakistan do you yeah, integrate so that component how do you uh all you have any plans or you can kind of give some value orientation about it how do you attach importance yeah. of olympism to traditional concept of sports in pakistan like yeah, i can so recall one, many uh, traditional sports in india you name it we used to play those marbles <laughs> kanche gulli danda we used to play kabaddi uh, tipu garam uh, all those have, games yeah. which brings you socialization so, which brings olympism so go, which brings free spirit so go, uh, so that's an how excellent do you look at those aspect concepts in pakistan please i think it's an excellent aspect that you have i'll first finish the earlier thing and then i will jump on to this so for so international olympic committee has given this whole big harassment toolkit so when i became the deputy secretary for women sports commission in pakistan olympic association the first thing i did was because it's a 300 page book and nobody is interested in you know reading because it's too reading long reading the so whole I lot squeezed, yes yeah so i squeezed it down to 16 pages and then made a nice interesting colorful presentation out of it and then translated it into our local language that is urdu right yes so and then and then you know the in every presentation in every seminar uh, the olympic association started projecting uh, that shorter version of the toolkit so that it is easier for every coach every athlete to understand the stance of the international olympic committee on harassment uh, in sports so i think you guys i mean if you are working in any sports organization national federation or the olympic body you should go uh, read that out and you know squeeze it down and because india is such a multi lingual country and maybe you know you can translate into gujarati and into hindi and some other languages so that i think will help a lot that makes now sense. thank to, you yeah now coming to your uh, traditional games question pitu gol garam you know there are many traditional sports with india and pakistan share because you know we have been together for years and years so pitu gol garam gulli danda and uh, kho kho all these games and stapu i have also played these games kanche I was not very good at Are you game, are I you tried. bringing these game components into Olympism movement or not at your local level? Yeah so what we do is that uh, I mean there is a, a proper federation which is called Traditional Games Federation and this federation has local bodies as well as international bodies and they do have traditional uh, uh, games competitions as well. Uh, so on and off uh, when we are uh, having workshops in schools particularly with younger kids and particularly government schools we do try to incorporate these games because they are not at all expensive you don't need any fancy equipment and you know uh, arenas for arenas for these and you can really touch masses while playing pitu gol garam because you can play pitu gol garam in the street you know on a path in the ground as long as, anyway. as, long as the participants are like friendly they are respecting each exactly. other they are mutually yeah. mutually understanding each other and they have sense of cohesiveness i think that serves yeah. the purpose and i'm very pleased yeah, to know so that you work on in contact with traditional games federation of pakistan please yes. my council special congratulations on this note and uh, <laughs> i think before i wind up i would like to ask would you like to say anything else which is you think i have not been able to ask you I think you have been very helpful throughout the session because you have been the driver actually, and you have been driving me back no, no. and forth. <laughs> uh, Thank you. you. I 
yeah, so thank you so much for conducting it very well and uh, the only thing i want that was my job assigned that was my job uh, assigned <laughs> to me by the organizers so, so the, i think the, it's a pleasure being in talk with you uh if you permit then i can give a closing note on it and do we have any questions i'll check with the organizers yeah. if you have any yeah. comments and yeah. questions yeah. Yes, uh, ma'am. Ma I definitely, I definitely want to be mindful of uh, both of your times. Uh, but uh, in case that you have more time on your hands, uh, then uh, you can continue as well. The viewers are absolutely loving this session. I'm seeing comments oh. coming in. People do not want this to uh, to end. Uh, so, of course, I want to be mindful of your time. But if you have a few more minutes, no. But if you have you. some of the comments, if I can see some of them, we can really yes, bring others' perspective yeah, to audience perspective also. Absolutely, we can merge absolutely, that together. Absolutely, ma'am. So yes. I've picked out a couple of them uh, and uh, I can pick out more as well. Sure. So can I'll start you share with, that uh, with us? Yes, ma'am. I'll start with uh, Namita Seni. I'll just quickly turn off uh, Adam M's screen. Great. Lovely. So I'll uh, start with uh, Namita Seni and she's asking us uh, another question for Ada. I'll read out a first question as well. This is the second question. Just goes to show how, how engaged uh, and interactive the audience has been so far. How much... Uh, uh, how many women in Pakistan have been participating in uh, Olympic education? So can you talk to us a bit more about women participation in uh, Olympic education in Pakistan? Yeah, so hi, Namita. Thank you for uh, the question. And I'm so glad to hear that people are liking it because uh, uh, and it's more because of Dr. Kiran because, you know, she's so no, 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 charming. And so if you don't have it, please <laughs> take accept the credits. Yeah, yes. thank you. So on Olympic education, so um, uh, Namita, as per the in Olympic Charter, you know, uh, in any activity and every activity we plan, we have to ensure that there is a 50%, 50%. And so if we are planning a workshop and it, we are allowed to have 30 participants, that we ensure that at least 10 to 15 participants are ladies and women, right? In the same manner, uh, in our leadership, in uh, the uh, formal uh, official quorum executive committee of the Olympic Association here in Pakistan, uh, we have maintained a good 30% of women leadership. So we have women as secretary general of the national federations. We have women um, as presidents of the federations. We have a whole women and sports commission. And then we have almost nine, six individual women members. So we do put a lot of stress uh, because coming from that women uh, empowerment perspective and coming from the fact that uh, in this South Asian region, uh, we do face a lot of challenges while projecting women. So, uh, so in all of our activities, all of our seminars, it's a 50%. So we try to, you know, balance the gender uh, while we are planning these uh, workshops and activities. Yes, next one, Anupam. Brilliant. Uh, yes, ma'am. The next one uh, that I want to pick out uh, is it's actually dedicated to you, Kiran, ma'am. Uh, so I know you have lots of fans yourself. Uh, and here's uh, Anurag Negi, not uh, a question, but with a comment saying, wow, amazing to see Kiran Sandhu, ma'am, after 2005, feeling so nice. Regards, Anurag Negi from uh, IGI Pest Batch uh, 2005. Uh, and he's uh, left his... My uh, sincerest regards. Thank you. Lots of love and lots of good wishes to my students. Thank you. I'm feeling Fantastic. very elated, very emotional, rather. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, there's a question from uh, Gauri Nayak, uh, and Gauri is asking, question for Ada, what are the strategies that you have used to integrate Olympic ideals in the development of communities, specifically development of communities within Pakistan? Uh, yeah, so thank you, Gauri, for your question. So. I mean, I will again reiterate that the first thing is to create awareness. Uh, most of us in the South Asian region and South Asian countries, I have observed this over the past five years in my career. When I tell somebody I work for Olympic as Association as a volunteer, they say, oh, do you play any sport? Are you an athlete? Are you a coach? Because they just can't relate to this thing that Olympism is beyond sports. Olympism is about education, Olympism is about culture. That's what I've been, you know, um, uh, uh, emphasizing on my presentation. So the first thing for community development that I have tried is creating awareness. So I have tried, uh, you know, engaging uh, my uh, my National Olympic Committee with the youth networks, with the women networks, with the uh, NGOs, with community-led initiatives. So once you start uh, to break that ceiling and start creating awareness step by step, 
uh, at provincial level then at national level even in the national games back in 2019 we had in peshawar uh, we planned a whole olympic quiz so there was a quiz for three days i was running it myself on the multimedia screen no fancy stuff i only they only gave me one L, big lcd and some chairs and carpets and i went to the um, store and picked up a lot of old t-shirts of different sports uh, events you know for every event we have these t-shirts so because we don't we didn't have so much budget to buy new gifts they only gave me one new gift that was a, uh, a cap of Olympic Association. I went to the store, I picked up all the old things and wrapped them and made them the gifts and then started inviting the athletes to participate in the Olympic quiz uh, on the ground once they're done with their event of the day. And we distributed those gifts and people were crazy and they enjoyed it so much. They took selfies with Pierre de Coubertin's, uh, you know, picture. Uh, and then we had the whole, uh, uh, media wall arranged for them. So it's just that for involvement of community, uh, giving them awareness and enhancing their outreach towards the organ for uh, with the organizations working for the philosophy of Olympism is important. That's the first thing you should do. And that's what I've been doing. Be it a school, be recently, that's the milk brand uh, that they, they're talking about home ground. So we are trying to build some sort of collaboration for this year's Olympic Day with Milo. So I mean, for engaging community and for developing community, you have to tap into the community. So if uh, try engaging mothers like, you know, MamaNet, you must have uh, watched the session of this MamaNet uh, yes. organization. So try, you know, exploring linkages and channels within the society that are localized to your local context. And that's how you do it. And that's how I have been doing it. Fantastic, next. fantastic. Ma'am, I must say, Ada, ma'am, you speak with so much uh, authenticity, so much candor, so much passion that uh, I have seen every single session so far, not just today, but yesterday as well. But this has been by far my favorite session. I should not be biased. Oh. And all the credit goes we to... We need to Kiran. make a bow for you. <laughs> all, all, all the credit goes to Kiran, ma'am, and Ada, ma'am, for this uh, fantastic session. Fact, uh, we have a Adam, couple... Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Anubha, I'd like to share with you, like we really wanted this session to be straight from after speaking to other for a few minutes, I realized this needs to be straight from the heart. I didn't want it to be a very formal uh, structured session in which um, like you really need to understand concepts. We are understanding how to do it. A very simple example, she's just quoted, you want to do Olympism or to promote, you must have will to do it, number one must create awareness two three have an action plan plan and activities number four create supporting communities have your organizations and local linkages that's it that's what we wanted these are written in the books these are done by all practitioners but the way Ada puts it it's so simple straight from her own experiences and i think i've summarized it in a way that a lump isn't from after seeing this whole listening to the whole session it should be a chain like a human chain. It should be values of Olympism like a human chain. One from the other, from the next, from the to the next, to the next, to the next. It's not one person's individual outlook. It's global outlook. And that's what we have valued in this session. And I'm sure yes, other will agree please. with my comment. No, you have Anyway, I'm not that will you please take on the comments from audience. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. I'm glad Absolutely, that people are liking it. Absolutely. I think, Kiran, ma'am, I think you summed it up beautifully. The structure of this uh, this session was slightly different as well. So it was definitely a breath of fresh air. Of course, taking nothing away from the presentation style that we've seen so far for most of the sessions. Uh, but in this case, you know, the fact that both of you, both uh, other ma'am as well as uh, you, were having an organic conversation with each other definitely made it a lot more relatable for the viewers as well. And viewers were able to chip in with, uh, with their inputs, with, with their views with their uh, questions so as well. I'm uh, really feeling happy about it. Very so pleased. happy, yeah. <laughs> That's how we want the audience, audience please. Thank you. Some yes. any other question? Any questions? Yes. Or uh, so we'll we'll end with a couple of questions. Uh, the first one might be slightly detailed, uh, but uh, we have no Namita Seni again, uh, who's uh, who of course has become a big fan, uh, who's saying, uh, I would like to ask uh, Miss Ada, as she has worked on uh, a lot of Olympism activities. Number one, what are the future initiatives for youth and youth ambassadors? And number two, what uh, difficulties have you faced uh, in uh, your bid to transform yourself as an inspiration for the youth in Pakistan? 
Yeah, so thank you, Nimita, for being so uh, you know engaged in the whole discourse. So to the first part of the question that you say that uh, what are the future initiatives for youth and youth ambassadors? So when we you see there is a general perception that uh, you know with the Olympic brand and with these rings, one thing is having in a suit. I have let me share it with all of you that I have never been to any Olympic games in my life well i am 31 it's been six years i'm working with the olympic association so so far i did not get a chance to be in the olympic arena and even then i feel so much attached and so much excited and so much um enthralled with these olympic ideas so it's not that you have been because that's a very prestigious um platform and only if we are a country of let's say 20 million, only 200 or 100 people from our country can actually go and feel that uh, you know uh, spirit of Olympism in the Olympic arena. So it's um, for future purposes. It's not that you are going to the mega games. You are going to the mega events. Bring the videos, put on multimedia, and you know share the uh, uh, let's say the opening ceremonies, the closing ceremonies of all mega games like Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, Asian Games, and that's where you bring in your room of twenty people all that energy which was there, right? And then from now, from then onwards, if you are planning let's say an interstate tournament, the best way to engage youth is to have volunteers for every single event. So if you have, let's say, an event where there are 200 participants, how you can involve any youth network is by giving them the leverage to handle the whole event, make a group of 25 to 30 uh, young ambassadors, tell two of them to manage the education awareness component of that sporting event, tell three of them to manage uh, the tell three of them to manage, let's say, the social media campaign. Because these days, if we don't put anything on Insta and on, uh, I don't know, so many softwares, you know, it doesn't uh, go viral. So it doesn't make sense. So that's how you involve youth. Because for involving youth in Olympism, you have to see their interest, what strikes them. Uh, the, you know, articles and history and all these things might not strike them. But if you tell a young uh, boy, uh, 18, 17 years old, that can you become the social media ambassador as a volunteer for my next sporting event? Bravo. That's how you have engaged that person, at least for once. And then to for the sports organizations and people working in uh, sports NGOs and community-led initiatives, it's very important to build a pool of volunteers. So if you have a website or if you have Google Drive or some sort of stuff, and let, let's say on your one of your events, 20 volunteers were engaged, keep their record, keep their email IDs, their pictures, everything. So start building up a pool of volunteers and a pool of Olympic ambassadors. And throughout the year, whenever you plan any activity on Olympism, be it an online session, a webinar, a workshop, a seminar, shoot them an email, send them a notification on Facebook or wherever. So staying connected uh, with the youth is very important. Uh, one thing which a lot of countries are not doing is collaborating with the embassies. Because in Pakistan, like uh, the US embassy is putting in a lot of money a lot of time and a lot of effort in engaging the youth. So I think even in India and in other countries, you should try uh, to break uh, uh, the and try to meet people who work for the embassies because they support financially also. And you know, if you want to plan an event on Olympism and if you want to plan an event on a health and well being, an event which is an amalgamation of uh, the SDGs and Olympism, you can definitely, you know, uh, put up a grant letter to any embassy and they have a lot of fun with the ambassadors with their consulates and they're always willing to pay so for engaging youth uh, namita can i see namita's question again because it's not uh, on the screen now on second question it's she's asking what were the difficulties again? Second, question, <clears throat> second part is what difficulties you faced okay yeah so yeah so um the most challenging part is that i i am a volunteer in the olympic movement I don't get paid for it. So I have a full time job, which I have been doing right like for a decade. I've been working for a school. So seven in the morning till 2 p.m. I had my school, then my lunch breaks. And then I was rushing to the Olympic office from five to nine at times, five to eight at times. And 
people were all the, my friends, my some people from the family and acquaintances, they kept asking me, do you get paid by them? I said, no, but it's my passion and I really want to do it and I want to bring a change and that's why I'm doing it. So um, this was a challenge that I had to balance my life. And then one edge that I have so far is that I'm single. I don't have a family. Uh, I have my mom at home to cook for me, to clean, get things clean for me. So, you know, I have always been on a ride. And over uh, the past two years, I've been traveling so much that there was always a suitcase packed for me, you know, to go to my next trip. Lucky girl, huh? uh, yeah yes. but uh, frankly girl. speaking I, I was on this scholarship and people at times think that yeah you know she's traveling the world but managing my job managing my home managing the olympic foundation and then managing my studies uh was Must be hard a, and time new, yes. yeah it was it was indeed so yes. there's just there's agree. This but then if there is a will there is a way namita no, uh, the that. clue is if there is a will there is a way yes anubhav we are back to you Yes, yeah, so somebody has Lovely. asked, Anubhav, uh, there is this uh, yes, someone, uh, Sorbi Saini, sorry for pronouncing it wrong. She is asking, period talk about Olympic sport period in school timetable. I mean, if you want to take this question, then can you put it on screen? I think it's something that we can, we can address. Is it this one, ma'am? Why yeah. can't I see the yeah, question? Yeah, this... you, can, you can see it now, ma'am. Okay, so on this question, Surbi, thank you for asking. So you are saying that period talk about Olympic sport period in school timetable is only two times in a week. How much students learn in? Okay, now for, because I've been an administrator, so I know very well how to play with timetables and how to play with the PE teachers, right? So um, what I did, as uh, Dr. Kiran also mentioned earlier, that I was working with the Olympic Association and one day I saw a post and it will be inspiring for most of you that post was from India on my Facebook timeline that there is a child sitting in the library and they posted first Olympic corner launched in India. I said, okay, Ari, Indi Indians are doing it. I should also do it. I went to the Olympic Study Center e uh, website. I took their email ID from there and I dra drafted a formal email and send them an email that we are a school of 2000 people. I have seen a recent post that there is a some library corner open in um, India. Can we also do this? So please feel free to talk. Next day, I got a reply from there. And not next day, I think a couple of days later. Then I sent an email to the my Olympic Association saying that uh, they have agreed to sending books almost. I think there are around 100 books. They have sent me free of cost for my school for building up that library corner in on the campus within my library. Now comes the next challenge that we have the books in the library, but we don't have time in the timetable to you know push it through. So what I did is that I told the English teachers and then the science teachers and then you know other teachers to mix and match and see because we have only we also have only twice a week sports period. So I told them to see that how can we again back to my slide where we were talking about integration in Olympism. So I told them to make, you know, when they are planning their lesson for the whole week, at least once a week, they should plan their lesson in a way that they are talking about Olympism, maybe in a comprehension. So English is done, Olympism is done. Okay. <laughs> so fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant, so and brilliant. then uh, so why, so when I was experimenting all th these things, I was approached by the school education department, government of Punjab. Punjab is a province of Pakistan. It's a big province. I was uh, contacted by the secretary of the school education department, and he said that all right, can you come for a meeting? I went, and then he said that we are propose we are uh, working on a school sports strategy uh, at province level. Would you like to work for us? So I said, well, I'm not a policy maker and I have always been, you know, a practitioner and a person who is in the field actually doing things less of, you know, too, any, too much reading. So he said, we had a, the meeting was scheduled for 10 minutes because the secretaries are so busy and school education is a big department. That meeting went on for one and a half hour. <laughs> and uh, there and then we decided that the, how the step Punjab school st st sports strategy will look like, 
there i propose that i want one segment of olympism to be incorporated in it then i plan a meeting of school uh, the school education department with the olympic association and they had one on one meeting in which we came and then uh, the aga khan foundation of education came in so that's how i build up the pieces together and uh, spend 3 to 4 months of time with some a team of junior consultants and then delivered the punjab school sports strategy first time ever in the history of pakistan that the government will be launching a proper school sports strategy so i mean timetables are always workable when you try and think out of the box again going to my slides that olympism is beyond sport so you can do olympism with social studies you can do olympism with ethics you can do olympism with the, all other subjects and that is what integration in education is Lovely. thank you ada that was really enlightening and i really appreciate the way you explain your nitty gritty uh, huh. approaches to sort out the situations you have that ada the style which i said in english you really have that power in you and you have Uh, showcased that that you can really bring that in forefront and get the uh, movement um, going and impact people with your initiatives uh, anubha Thank would you, you uh, want me to give a close up or would you have any other remark or a question so no more no more questions there's one question from me but i'll save that for the the very end uh, but i'll just uh, as you know as kiran ma'am said uh, other ma'am i think you're a, you're a true hero you're a true uh, warrior and it's not just me saying this it's not just kiran ma'am saying it uh, i think uh, it, this sentiment has been echoed by everyone who's watching as well so uh, namita saini again saying you are amazing ada that's the passion <coughs> hats off to you then uh, daisy marwa saying a wonderful session with lots of learning thoroughly enjoyed oh, and uh, many so many such uh, similar questions uh, here's so a gori naik saying uh, thank you to both of you for the wonderful session uh, so uh, you we've seen <laughs> <laughs> thank you ma'am we've seen we've seen comments such as these uh, dime a dozen from uh, everyone daphne again saying wow other beautiful and inspiring thank, thank you for you sharing so your, much, guys. your lovely story thank you Brilliant. i'm honored thank you and and kiran ma'am before right. i hand it over to before you before we to hand it over session, yes. yes yes there's just one thank question you. one question <laughs> from uh, sure. me in case we have time it won't take more than a couple of minutes uh, yes, yes, other ma'am ma other ma'am on uh, on popular request uh, see we've seen lots of questions uh, related to olympism i was thinking of changing gears just for a little bit you know and we can perhaps end on okay. a, a light hearted note uh, i am indian but one of my favorite songs uh, is uh, dil dil pakistan and i heard it for the first time during the 2019 <laughs> cricket world cup because i think uh, that's a song that lots of pakistani fans sing when they in the stadium when they're trying to uh, cheer for their side and i'm absolutely addicted to the song and i think you know we are global citizens uh, of course we're indians we're pakistanis yeah. but we're global citizens so i think we can uh, we can sing that song so look i would request you to perhaps sing this song with me how about we sing this in unison and uh, kiran ma'am in case sure. you know Surely, in case you know yes, the lyrics I'll to the song i'll join in whatever best well. i can yeah i will join sure, sure. in why not right so why we can not, we can we can we can, we can do the we can do the chorus so we can do dil dil pakistan ja ja pakistan we can do the chorus yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do okay. that. Okay. All right. You okay. sing first. I follow you. Uh, yes, okay. ma'am. One, okay. One, two, and three. Dil, 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 Pakistan, Pakistan, ja, 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 Pakistan, Pakistan, dil, dil, Pakistan, Pakistan, dil, ja, ja, Pakistan, Pakistan. Ashi zami. It's something like that. ऐसे जमी और आसमां इनके सेवा जाना कहा हर दिन रहे ये रोशनी चलता रहे ये तारे पाकिस्तान i like to first give a big thank you to narendra dhruv patra dr narendra dhruv patra the president of indian olympic association mr prashant kushwaha chairman indian olympic education committee rajesh rakesh malik 
organizing secretary of the webinar and members of Indian Olympic Education Committee, my online host, Anupav, and very special thanks to Neeraj Kumar Mehra for his persistent effort to bring me back to my people in the sporting world in India. Thank you, Neeraj. I would have never done it if you were not insisting so much. But I'm very pleased and very fortunate. I'm feeling very pleasured that I am in this moment along with you. And most importantly, Ada Jafri, without you, today's day would have been dry, high. But now we are all feeling satisfied, professionally happy. And it's been pleasure talking to you. And I'm sure my viewers and listeners, they all had joined in and they made it so very meaningful that I have no words to say thank you to them. From bottom of my heart, my viewers, and thank you. My listeners, a very special thank you for sparing your time to be with us in this session. The talk by Ada Jaffrey was how Olympism serves the humankind. No matter what medium is, is it a traditional sport, high-end sport, or a digital approach? But it serves the humankind. It brings that Olympism spirit of respect, mutual faith, friendship, and respect, admiration for each other. This was also to promote philosophy of Olympic towards empowerment of being, being in education, getting fun, and self-actualizing yourself to the maximum potential. Her whole talk was around how she has felt self-actualized, how her passion has brought Olympism to people. So that's what probably is the message today we are taking home, that you can feel self-actualized through the moment where you commit yourself. And Olympism is the far better, the best medium to really feel connected to people. Ada has also showcased power of Olympism and how institutions, culture, heritage, and movement of ambassadors can play a role in it. And most importantly, what is new normal in the COVID scenario and role of digital medium in its promotion of Olympism. Olympic, Olympism is ever evolving. This is for you, for you all. This is for me. This is for everybody to experience the values of Olympism, excellence, respect, and friendship. Now, more so in the changing scenario of digital times, when we are not with each other, I think Olympism is the true, strong, and the most strong tool to be connected with each other. Thank you, Ada. Once again, thank you, Anubhav. Thank you, thank you Vyos. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I will thank you. You have concluded it so well. I mean, you know the art of speaking far, far, far better than me. And I'm, it's such an, you know, it's so It's the art of doing, not speaking. Um, yes, Anubhav, leave it to you. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so the, the only thing I want to say is uh, thank you, Neeraj, because he, it's been 10 days that he is honestly daily giving. I have not been so well in the last week, and it's been 10 days daily hats off to his persistence he is reminding me have you prepared your slides make sure your internet connection is working fine so he has been a big support and thank you team yard and uh, all what i have presented to you guys is because of the freedom that is given to me by my organization and my country and particularly pakistan olympic association so on this platform where so many people are admiring and aspiring the talk i really want to thank uh, the president lieutenant uh, Sayyid Arif Hassan of Pakistan Olympic Association, the Secretary General uh, Khalid Mahmood Saab, and um, the Olympic Committee of India. And I congratulate them uh, for this great initiative. And frankly speaking, till we are locked down, I would love to see more coming from your side. And whenever you want me, I am there to come and share things. All those digital resources that I've shared, I'll be sending the links to Anubhav and also the IOC harassment toolkit. And then, you know, you can send it out to the audience and those who are interested. So thanks a lot. Thanks, I thoroughly enjoyed the whole session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Anubhav. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, so that concludes proceedings for that session. What's ironic is that uh, because of uh, certain internet issues that uh, other members experiencing initially, we thought that, you know, we might not be able to hit the 50 minute mark, uh, but we've actually gone on uh, for one and a half hours. Uh, that's how oh, lovely God. and lively <laughs> the conversation you, was lovely. So it's, it's now finally time uh, to actually pivot uh, to uh, the next uh, session, uh, which will be moderated by Dr. Mukesh Agarwal, who's the head of the Department of Physical Education, Maharaja Agrasen College, uh, University of Delhi, India. 
and uh, i am actually very lucky and i feel very honored to be with uh, dr mukesh agarwal and i will be listening to everything that he has to say on uh, the topic uh, that he has in mind i can very briefly establish what the topic is and uh, mukesh uh, dr mukesh agarwal can give you more information on it uh, and of course this is going to be an interactive discussion between uh, me as well as uh, dr agarwal uh, and in case uh, you have any questions uh, as is tradition you can simply type them out in the comment section and i'll be uh, sure to pick them up uh, as uh, they come my way throughout the live stream uh, so the topic that will be discussed uh, is the interplay of uh, volunteer values circumstances and experiences in uh, promoting a sustainable volunteering legacy especially with regard to learning from the london 2012 uh, olympic uh, games uh, dr agarwal uh, you can hear me clearly right i can see you very clearly you're on mute right now but you can unmute yourself and then uh, you should be able to uh, start speaking Yes, doctor. Me? Yes, doctor Agarwal. No, okay. we've we've unmuted you. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Now you hear me clearly? Anwar, well, can you hear me? Yes, yes, doctor Agarwal. I'm we can hear you clearly yeah. as well. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you clearly as well, doctor Agarwal. Yeah. Thank you very much for the session. Though I was a moderator for the session, and doctor Nikki must be there, but I think some technical issues are there. Might be some internet connection issues are there. So she is not with us. Whenever she has joined me, we can start our session on the. one entertaining program with the dr nikki kotrao but uh, in the meantime i would like to share a concept of family olympic i have a discussion with the international indian olympic education committee and they said ki i can just throw this idea over here so that if there is any query and comment from the people that we can incorporate for a better understanding so this concept for family olympic first comes in my mind uh, two year back where we are thinking for the organizer activity and we find the people they feel very difficulty to come out for the practice session so since i working from last 20 year in the field of physical education and sports and find the complaint of the students that my mother won't allow me to come for the ground uh, especially for the girls students uh, sometimes boys also feel very discomfortable uh, especially when they are in the final year or uh, uh, they are from the uh, difficult courses so they were common complaint that my family is not supporting me to come for the sports Uh, we are thinking for the olympism and inculcate the values of the olympic values in the people through the sports activity and we didn't get the support from the family itself it's very difficult for the people to come out of the box just to take the challenge every time from their family members it's very difficult for them so i, I have such of something about the family olympic that uh, what actually happened throughout the world in the field of sports or uh, especially what people do read about the family olympic i have found that uh, people have a concept for the uh, playing together means uh, they have a separate sections if uh, parents are going to play so they take their kids along with them there is a separate area for the kids to play so they play within the kids uh, the same thing with the male partner same thing with the female partner they have the different groups to play so uh, it's very difficult for them to understand the problems of each other sometimes it happens that the uh, one of the partner uh, suppose male is very sporty but female is not when they go out together the female always have a complaint why you got indulged in the sports for a long time they are knocking with the time every time uh, sometimes parents take the kids uh, along with them for the sports section then sports uh, the kids doesn't want to come out from the playing area then they have a complaint so sometimes uh, when we are going for a good mood but when we back we have a complaints for each other but for the sporting event for the recreation we want to have a joy we should be bring back to the home then only we can have a satisfaction from the inside we can inculcate the peace we can really take the fruit a real charm of the sports what we want to have it's not the thing that time we are playing in the sports field for one hour it will remain over there it should be sustained at least for the 24 hours because uh, all the studies researches are there uh, the people those are participating in this uh, webinar the spectators the delegates the speakers everybody has a common consent and the notion and the idea about all these activities and the research which has going on throughout the world but when we are taking out the research out of the field that means our sports field is like a clinic research when we take it out to the real life situation we find it very difficult that does we really get the true output is not 
I'm coming from being a player. I'm coming from a house by fighting with my parents. No, no, I want to play. I come to the field. Okay, I enjoyed over there. I take my enjoyment, my peace, my recreation for one hour, two hour, three hours. But the time I leave the field, I again have a problem in my mind. What will be happen when I go back to home? I need to take out few explanations each and every time. So it won't work to play in the sports without the support from the family. So when I search out for concept of the family sports and I find it that uh, especially countries like uh, Australia, there is, uh, I found once I was in Australia, I find it that there is a very sporty culture over there. Normally after four or 5 p.m., all the people come out from the house and they are going to the big grounds and play out there. Uh, in the last session, Dr. Kiran Sandhu is there. She was also a teacher of faculty where I studied in uh, Delhi University College. And now she's in Australia. She might have a better understanding. But again, I've seen the same culture over there. The younger people, they are playing with the young, young people only. The children, they're playing in the children's capability only. The adults, one, they are, have a different playing zone and they're playing within themselves. There is no concept where I find out that all the people are playing together as a whole unit. So sometimes when you go out, we play, then it is a winning or losing is a component of a single person, not of the entire family. When we come out with the concept of the family sports, what we have designed and I will explain it a bit later, then it is a common unity if we, I lost. I will have a responsibility of the entire family to get losing of the match. So the learning will take place in the entire family. In the part of the education, we normally said, if you educate a male, you educate a single person. But if you educate a female, you are educating the entire family. Likewise, in the field of sports, I endorse the statement. If you make a family educated about the sports, make them allowed to enter in the field of the sports, then the entire family can enjoy the real fruit of the sports. So my concept for the family sports, I just give a brief introduction so that then we can have a close conversation and can have a better idea about the people. Uh, for family sports, we have, we have launched an idea where all the members of the family, initially we took a family, a nuclear family where um, mother, father, and two kids, normally in the scenario of the modern world, you hardly get a, uh, families where you get a more than two kids over there. So mother, father, and two kids. All four will comprise a one team. So also we make to customize the game where we eliminate the component which is normally required for a competitive sport, like strength, speed, because it is difficult for the person to come out in the sports and compete with the person who is already indulged in the field of sports. So we eliminate these components, which is dominantly play a role in the competitive sports. So we make a team of the four people we make them underlined in an age group so that we can make a equality among the people. Like we make a team of under 100. That means the all the four people will comprise a total age group of 100, not more than 100 years. So that we restrict a group where we can find out somewhere that a, a father have an age around 40, mother has an age around 40, and two kids have an age around 10, 10. So it can be 92, it can be 95, it can be 100, it can be 99. So you can see that means that all the groups are almost compatible to each other. Because if you are in the middle age group, your kids must be somewhere in the age group of 10 to 11 years. So that's why you will get a concept over there. The second thing, what we indulge, that to make uh, most of the teams, rather all the teams should have a component of two females and two males. That means mother, father, brother, and sister. So that again will give a equality among the groups. So no will get a over advantage from each other. But normally in sports, we have seen and we have an understanding for the growth and development pattern in the age group of 10, 11, 12. There is hardly any difference between the boys and girls. All of them have same uh, comparatively endurance and strength. It is only after puberty, somewhere after the age of 13 or 14 years, we have found out the main difference between the male and female child. Right. So likewise, we can make a team of under 100, then under 120, and under 140. Likewise, the sample, but we have to come out for the play. There we find that a lot of the people, they have hesitation to come in the field of sports. 
because they never ever play a sports. Like in the last session, I heard about the uh, from the other Jafri. She said that she never ever been in the field of sports. She never played any sports. But it hardly matters. The time you enter in the field of sports, the joy, the excitement, what you experienced matters a lot. It's something like the Olympic education, Olympic values. It's not totally the responsibilities on your shoulder to make a win. You can have a sporting role always. It's not every time you are the flag zero for the things. It's like a team where uh, if the player are 11, uh, those are in the playing condition and the team is 16. That doesn't mean that uh, 12th player or 13 or 14 players have no value. They do have the value. They do have to contribute in the field of sports. And the important thing is, it's not only the matter of winning or losing. It's a matter where you feel the values, the enjoyment, the recreation you derive from the sports. We did the first experiment in my own college a year back. Uh, though a lot of things are there to put the struggle on, to convince the people with the new idea, to have the several meetings with the staff, then the principal, then the further authority to get the approval for the same. But finally, we managed and we got around 82 teams ready to participate in the event. And the teams are from the college students. There, we take out them for their mother, father, the college students, and their siblings. For their, for the siblings, especially in the college category, we make them a two type of segregation, where the sibling is a, uh, both male, or the sibling is male and female, and the sibling is both female. Because we can understand in the, in the age of, uh, say, 18 or 19 years, there's a lot of difference between the people to participate, between a male component and the female component. If both of them are the laymen's, I'm not talking about the people those are already indulged in the field of sports. The athletic people won't have a many uh, difference, but we make them arrange accordingly so that they won't get be cheated or they won't get be over advantage on one of each other. So accordingly, we plan it out and we introduce the event and we, we got a very wonderful feedback from the parents. They said, it's really our first time to enter in the field of sports would never ever be, especially the mothers and even the fathers. They said, we won't even come in the field of sports. And they have a notion that definitely we won't resist our students to come in the field of sports ever. Because it's really such an enjoyment in the field of this digital technology. It's very difficult for them to maintain or sustain their health along with the enjoyment. People had to pay a lot to maintain their health, to pay in the wellness center, to pay in the gym to get the fitness. But in the field of sports, you will get everything as a byproduct, which usually you are purchasing as an important or essential product. So the culture for the sports, once we get inculcated in the people, then definitely this will serve more than few, uh, more than four or five purposes. Whether it is the inculcating of the values, whether it is the inculcating of fitness among the people, whether it is to take the people uh, uh, eliminated through the mobile phones and uh, this technology where people get dedentary and also the activism of their brain when they come in the field of sports. And the important thing, when they are come in, in the field of sports, then their relatives, their neighbors, their, four, uh, their uh, grandparents, they also get indulged automatically with them. You need not to take extra effort to create the awareness among the people about the sports. Because in the digital technology, whatever the achievement people had made, they just put it on the Twitter, on the Facebook, on the Instagram. So it will spread a message automatically among the people. So likewise, many things are there which can we achieve through this uh, family sports. Uh, definitely the session with the Dr. Nikki, but uh, unfortunately she's not uh, joined this webinar right now. Uh, her concept was the students, how? Go on, Dr. Agarwal, carry on. Okay. So the concept, this is what we have prepared for the voluntary training management. Uh, we have seen this in the CWG 2010 also, when a lot of people, a lot of students has been engaged for this uh, voluntary training. And uh, definitely this, uh, this was a very successful program in 2010, when the student volunteers are there. And a lot of the students have been called from the colleges also. 
And among those volunteers, I think only 25 to 30 percent people are there. Those have been associated with the sports ever. And 75 percent are the students from the academic side. But if you imagine when we have a population of 130 crores and the entire population in the world is somewhere 500 to 600 crores, everybody get indulged in the field of sports, then your volunteer management program will be automatically trained. You need not to tell a student that how to behave in the field of sports. We have to get stopped. Where is the enter line of the uh, playing field area where we get restricted ourselves? So a lot of things can be searched out and uh, health, fitness. These are the very simple concepts which can be uh, purchased as a byproduct when we indulge in the sports. This is my concern. Topic is a lot, of, lot more to think. But Absolutely. I think if uh, discussion can be made, then I can make you more apprised about this concept of MD Olympic. Absolutely. Yes, Dr. Agarwal. We can... Uh... We can have a couple of questions uh, before yeah. concluding. So here's uh, Pooja, who's asking us on a Facebook platform. You talked about your uh, module. And so she says, what about a family of only one girl child or uh, only child? Will they be eligible in your module? Everybody is eligible in the module. It's not like a machine, but we have prepared. Everything is customized, which can be prepared as per the requirement of the sample participants. For this particular purpose, when this question comes to us, especially when we conduct this event, we have a hostel in our college where 50 girl students are there. They said, sir, we have a problem. How can we come out and take participation in this? Then we just had a meeting with the faculty members and we decide if one of the faculty members can adopt one child out of them. So what they did, one of our faculty of the college, uh, whether a uh, male or female, they take their spouse and one of their child along with them. And one of the child they are up from the hostel to make a team. This is a combination what we have made out in a particular type of sample. But we can customize it from four to three member team also. It's not necessary to go for a four member team. We can make it three member team where mother, father and one child. These three will comprise a one team also. So customization can be done at any point of time. Brilliant, brilliant. Let's see if I can add her to the screen. She might be on a phone call, so she might be slightly tied up right now. Right. Let me see if she can hear us. Uh, Neeraj, ma'am, can you hear us? I think you had a question for Dr. Agarwal. Neeraj, ma'am? Not sure if uh, she can hear us. Uh, but anyway, we have a, a couple of minutes left uh, before we conclude this. Uh, Dr. Agarwal would love uh, any uh, concluding remarks uh, from you to close the session out. Yeah, definitely. My humble request, because uh, especially in this pandemic where COVID-19 is there and uh, everybody is affected from it, I find a lot of people there playing on their terrace with their kids, which is a very unusual phenomenon But I have seen from last uh, uh, my age or somewhere 45 years. So, but this pandemic will make a good thing, which will make the people bring back to their family and they can utilize their time with the family as a single unit, which is a best requirement or the basis for the family Olympic to be conducted. Once a family will be involved in the sports, then definitely the Olympic movement will go a long way. Absolutely. And the efforts would be reduced to a great extent to spread yes. this knowledge. Well said, Dr. Agarwal. Brilliant. Uh, we'll we'll definitely conclude uh, on uh, that very positive uh, note uh, of yours. Uh, it's a shame that the speaker wasn't able to join the session uh, because of certain uh, technical issues uh, that the speaker was experiencing. But this was still a very, very uh, insightful session. And I'm pretty sure everyone who was watching definitely took a lot away uh, from uh, the, the 20 or 25 minutes uh, that you had uh, time to spend with them. Saroj Panwar here says, uh, nice discussion. And I'm pretty sure Saroj here is echoing the sentiments of everyone who was uh, a part of this. Thank you so much again for joining us uh, on our One Play Sports Networks. Uh, we'll conclude this session and uh, we'll kick things off uh, in about a couple of minutes uh, with the 3 p.m. Indian Standard Time session. Thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you, Anubo. And I'm very thankful for the entire uh, Indian Olympic Association, especially Dr. Nandar Dhrupatra, the chairman of this uh, Indian Olympic Education Committee, Mr. Prashant Kushwaha, 
and uh, Dr. Rakesh Malik, Organizing Secretary. Definitely an overview and the entire team of your IOEC and the StreamYard broadcast and especially Reju. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. On behalf on behalf of One Play Sports, uh, we're extremely grateful to be partnering with speakers, moderators uh, such as you, as well as with the Indian Olympic Association and the Indian Olympic uh, Education Committee. So I will be ending this uh, live stream right now and we'll be starting a new live stream across all the different platforms that we're currently live on so we'll end this right now and we'll go live again on facebook on youtube on tiktok on hello and twitter so if you're watching this stream currently be sure to shift over to the new live stream that we'll be launching in a couple of minutes so i'll end this one but i'll see you on uh, the next live stream thank you so much guys take care